everyone. Welcome to the Inspiring Philosophy channel. I am Mike Jones, the former rapper. Yes, I don't look like I did in the music videos from 20 years ago, but it is definitely me. Uh, today, we are going to be responding to a recent video by Paulo Gia, or as he's known by people who have never pronounced his name, Paulo Gia. Uh, we'll be going through a uh, recent response he posted to me. Well, it wasn't so much him. He had someone on named Camille Greger to respond to an argument I put out on defending traditional gospel authorship. And so he posted a 90-minute video where Camille sort of goes through that video and tries to address a lot of the arguments. And so I got numerous requests to respond to that. And I was like, ah, what the heck? We can do that. It's not going to be that hard. But it might take a while because uh, there's a lot there to go on. Uh, a lot of the arguments are not going to be hard to address. There's just a lot there that needs to be go through. So we're not going to be playing the full video. We're going to try to hit the main points. So I have timestamps as you know I've typically done in the past, like when I've responded to Daniel Hakiki Chu. And as you also know from those streams, they can go quite long, but I'm in here for the long haul. And ever since I've been on TikTok, I've been in more, I've been in a more confrontational mood. So I will be here as long as it takes to get through this whole video. None of my guests are required to stay that long. They're welcome to, but I think Steven and Eric said they probably need to cut out early. Than does Than has to stay. He can't leave. He has to he has to stay the whole time. That's a rule I have. So I'll make sure my so kids just, know that. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So let me introduce my guests. I have Eric Manning of Testify. I have Fan of Exploring Reality and Stephen Boyce. What is your channel, Stephen? Do you have one or do you just kind of float around? You're muted, Stephen. Come on. This is a professional channel. Get it together. Sorry about that. I was go. trying to be a good I was trying to be good about this. I was trying to be like, all right, I'm gonna be quiet. I'm not gonna let any background noise come in, and then that's my introduction. So uh, no, so my channel, uh, we have an apologetics entire network called Explore Christianity. You can find that on explorechristianity.net. My podcast is called Facts, which is an acronym for Father's Apocryphal Text or Canon Text and Scripture. So you can find that on any of the mainstream uh, podcast venues. But that's the, the main two things that we do and we work with is Explore Christianity. And then the podcast that I do is Facts. Awesome. So, yeah, I'll link to that below after I get off the stream. Uh, so let's get right into it. Uh, real quick, when when I saw this video that Camille basically did on uh, Paul's channel, um, I wasn't. I, I I thought it was done graphically well. I wasn't too impressed with the arguments, to be honest. He go Camille spends a lot of time going down rabbit trails that don't really affect traditional gospel authorship arguments, which I'll note later. A lot of his arguments are just independent, like of whether or not the Gospels go back to their four main authors or not. Uh, what are your guys' thoughts? Stephen, what were your thoughts about the whole video? Yeah, I think I think it's one of those same criteria that we find on a regular basis now. I mean, it's become the norm. I, I actually saw this coming a few years ago. I actually told Elijah Hickson, who's one of the co-writers of Myths and Mistakes of New Testament Textual Criticism, I said, I have this feeling that the argument, there's always been an argument against the traditional authorship of the canon. Mm -hmm. But I, I had this feeling that textual criticism was going to become a boring conversation that we've overstepped and overstated and that it was going to move to this. So I actually started jumping on this earlier and, and the storm that I predicted ended up coming. And this video is just another item of the same thing. It is, it's an attempt to discredit by saying, that the, the, the amount of evidence that we so-called have now and the earliest patristics and then the inscriptions on the manuscripts are just a massive cluster. They don't work together. They don't correspond together. They don't add up together. The, the earliest attestation has one stating of them and one statement about them or one inscription about them or no inscription about them. And so it's, it's one of the same things. This is another video. I think it's, again, well done. I don't think it was poorly made. I think it was, it was very well made. Uh, there are some very key statements that were made in there that I think are fair, but need extra context to them. Uh, yeah. Like there's certain observations that I think are true. They're fair. And I think there's explanations for them. I think that he, he makes everything too black and white. It's yeah. either this or it's not. And so I would say it was well done. There were some fair statements made, but a little bit of context probably would answer some of his uh, concerns and skepticism. All right. Eric, what did you think? What were your overall thoughts? Um, I mean, I think it's better than your average video yeah. debunking the oh, authorship yeah. of the Gospels. Uh, I think there's uh, Camille is uh, definitely a really intelligent person. 
Um, I think there's a lot of stuff that just is spun out that sound to, to me like just so stories and in, in certain cases. And it was just kind of like, I don't see how that follows or there was like assumptions that were made of like all of this dependence on where all the information came from um, that I, I think is highly contestable. It just felt like there was a lot of things that were, I don't know, kind of take, kind of taken as assumed that yeah. I, I think don't stand on the kind of grounds that he's as confident in is, is in. Well, so, um, but you know, those are just a few things. Well, I would just say there's a lot of stuff he spends a lot of time on, which just don't really, again, address the, the question of the, do the gospels uh, go back to the four traditional authors or not. But uh, Sam, what were your yeah. thoughts? And then we'll jump right into the video. Yeah, I mean, like, I think it was a well done video. One of the things I appreciate about Camille is that he's actually just kind of intellectually rigorous, at least when it comes to these things, where a lot of the counter apologists that you run into, they tend to just kind of push things aside and call you an apologist and then just kind of try to play that rhetoric game. So I'm really appreciative of that. I'm kind of going off what Eric said, and, and I know there might be some disagreement just among uh, amongst us here about the genre of what the gospels are and stuff like that. But one of the things that stood out to me is that um, one of the underlying assumptions that he kind of relies on for his argument is this assumption that the gospels are Greco-Roman biographies and a lot of his parallels or lack of parallels that he points to um, are used to discredit the traditional authorship of the gospels on the assumption that they are on this genre of Greco-Roman biography. But we're only comparing Greco-Roman works to something that I wouldn't com call Greco-Roman biographies, um, if that makes sense. So I think a lot of the parallels that he tries to draw and the comparisons that he tries to draw don't really work because the underlying assumptions for his ha half of his argument would be something that I would challenge. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot to be said there, but that's kind of stuff that for a, a different, I think for a different stream too, but yeah, yeah. that's, in terms of what the purpose of this stream is just going to be focusing on the question is, do the four Gospels go back to Matthew, Mark, yeah. and John? Are those titles early? Uh, would the church have accepted anonymous Gospels and only added the titles in the second century? That's what we're going to focus on. So uh, when we get into the stream, we're going to try very hard to stay on that topic because that's the real question at hand. Real quick, a uh, note about Super Chats. I will do Super Chats at the end. I'm not going to go through them throughout the stream because I don't want to slow us down and I want to be respectful to uh, my guests and their time. So questions will be saved to the end. If you have a super chat comment, I will put it on the screen, but that in, if it's something that doesn't need to be addressed, that is, or a question or something like that. So with that, we're going to dive right in here. Again, I made timestamps. We're not going to have time to go through literally every word said. We're going to try to hit the main points here. But again, it might go for a while, so buckle up. And let's dive right in. So I thought I would start with this section right here, uh, starting at 153. So here we go. There's a couple of clarifications that I want to make before we begin. First, it's important to unpack what saying that the four canonical gospels were originally anonymous entails and to distinguish between several different questions. The question of how gospel manuscripts were titled is distinct from the question of gospel authorship. For example, some scholars have held that the Gospel of Mark was actually written by a person named Mark, but it doesn't automatically follow that these scholars also subscribe to any particular theory about who this Mark was. A student of Christian apologist Mike Lacona have recently written a study in which he counted how many biblical scholars believe that the Gospel of Mark was written by Mark and how many believe that Peter is a source behind that Gospel. And those two sets only have a partial overlap. Second, there's a... Okay, so real quick, uh, the argument seems to be is that many might say it goes back to Mark, but may not be the actual uh, Mark interpreter of Peter. Uh, Eric, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I mean, again, this is kind of a separate issue. Like you kind of said at the beginning, he, he yeah. does kind of go off on some rabbit trails here and there. Um, I would just say there's very good evidence that it is a, a Petrine-driven uh, memoir. I know Richard Bauckham has written written a lot about uh, this particular topic. Um, Paul Barnett uh, has some uh, really good comments in, in, in some of his works there. And so uh, as far as it being a Petrine uh, driven memoir, um, I mean, it would be a whole other episode if we were going to get into those arguments and dive into well, this that. Is, this is what I wanted to start with here for a reason, because yeah. it's like, 
like th- this may be an entirely separate issue. I, I, I mean, like, and again, I would also say it's going to be a much simpler explanation to say it's Mark, the interpreter of Peter, because that tends to be a pretty well attested tradition in the church uh, versus it just being some other mm-hmm. Mark who came about later. Stephen, what are your thoughts on this? You're muted again, Stephen, for the love of God. That's what I do. It's what I do. Just, <laughs> just silence. Boomerang. Um, no, I, I think it goes back to the things that we talk about with the patristics and the attestation. If you have, if Peter and Paul and these others have started churches and they have written to these churches, whether they're letter form or accounts of their memories or sermons, which is the alleged statement here, we don't have to go anywhere further than the patristics to find unanimous agreement on who's behind the gospel of Mark and that it is John Mark. I mean, you can go to the Coptic churches, find their lineage of of bishopric that goes back to John Mark who started it after Peter's execution in Rome. It goes down to Alexandria, begins churches. They lean, they lean into their lineage going back to John Mark. We have earliest attestation of his burial where he was placed, bishops that went to go see his grave before their executions, like uh, another bishop named Peter at the time visiting the grave of John Mark. They all talk about the the account that Peter gave him that was left there. We have Papias who mentions it. We have Irenaeus who mentions it. We have Jerome who mentions it. We have Clement Alexandria who mentions it. We have multiple statements about how Peter was the person behind the gospel of Mark and that letters were collected, his sermons were collected, and it was put into a written form. We have internal evidence of this. I demonstrated in multiple places of research and written and in oral that if if Peter's going to be behind the gospel of Mark, we, we're going to need some evidence for that. We're going to need things to show up that would show Petrine, Petrine favoritism, Petrine involvement. And that's what we see in the gospel of Mark. The whole narrative is pushed one direction or another based on Peter understanding things or not understanding mm-hmm. things. We have Peter speaking on behalf of the whole apostolic group, being addressed on behalf of the old the whole apostolic group. We have his intentions and his thought processes being unveiled in the letter, the way he's thinking, what's in his mind, uh, his direction, his mode, his, his thoughts. We don't have that when we look at Luke and we look at Matthew in comparison, the way that we have it in Mark's gospel. So we also have internal leanings into Peter. We also have inclusio eyewitness connections from the beginning where he is cited first into the narrative. And we make sure the in the very end of chapter 16, you find, tell my brothers and Peter. It, it makes sure to end the letter even or end the book, end the writing with Peter's name being last explained. And so we even see the connection in the very beginning of this. So we have attestation from the earliest church that was started there by Mark himself, connecting it to, to Peter, giving it to Mark. We have Mark being connected to Peter as an amanuensis from all the patristics, and there's no other candidates. We also have internal reason to believe Peter is telling it. I also want to really quick and let everybody else jump in. When you look at it as well from the perspective of the the writing, can we find that it was once an oral tradition? This was the longest research I did on Mark is if it was a sermon that was brought to a written text, we should find difficult transitions. And I've noted multiple places where it appears to be an Aramaic sermon at times that was progressed into Greek writing. And I think that's what Papias was actually saying happened when he said others translated. It's difficult to understand if he means they translated or whether uh, they interpreted. Sometimes it's translated interpreted. What exactly does that mean? I think what he was saying is, is that John Mark translated an oral tradition and made it a written tradition. And if that theory is true, we should be able to find roughness in the Greek where it's very difficult to take oral statements and bring them into a written form. Mark is the most difficult of the gospels to find consistency of, of written pattern. It's very sloppy. It's a lot of run on. There's times where even the writer, just for example, the writer does not mention Jesus's name over and over, just goes he, him, his. And Mm -hmm. our English translations to supplement that aren't constantly put Jesus's name back in the text. So you don't forget the antecedent in and and the noun and the pronoun. And, but in the Greek, it's not that way. It's continually ran on as if it was one large storytelling that never got interrupted. And so there's evidence all through it. And we, and, and and that's another show as well, but these are things to me that give, hi, we got consistency with the patristics. 
the history of the, the Coptic church itself. We've got the oral traditions. We've got internal evidence that lean that way and, and speak to that. To me, there's consistency across the board. Why reject it? Yeah, and just to add to that, Maurice Casey wrote a book called Aramaic Sources on Mark, I believe it was, about 20 or 30 some years ago. And he goes through and demonstrates that a lot of these uh, different speeches that Jesus gives in Mark seem to have underlying Aramaic sources. In fact, they make more sense in these reconstructed Aramaic sources. And that would suggest that Mark is getting his information from some sort of Aramaic speaker, uh, and he is translating them into Greek. Uh, and so this would fit with the whole idea of Mark being Peter's interpreter and taking these Aramaic sayings and moving them in there. So it just seems when you look at all that data, the simplest explanation, the most parsimonious is it's going to be Mark, the interpreter of Peter. Uh, I'll do a later video this year on internal evidence for Mark, but just with looking at the external evidence and the little bit of internal we mentioned here, it seems that it's most likely going to be Mark. So, hmm. all right. With that, as I said, we have different timestamps. I'm going to jump ahead here. Uh, the next timestamp I have is at 5.37, so I will go to a little bit before it to make sure we get it in. Anonymous. And so the argument the Gospels do not eternally identify the authors is not actually evidence they were known as anonymous works. I thought it would be nice to start with a point of agreement and acknowledge that when it comes to this specific aspect of the debate, Michael and the scholars he's citing are absolutely correct. Michael references an article in which Simon Gavakol responds to several scholars who think that a strict internal anonymity of the Gospels, meaning the Gospel authors never explicitly identify themselves by name in the text, is surprising. This is a good opportunity to highlight that there is no division between Christian scholars and so-called skeptics. To my knowledge, all the scholars who are referenced by Gavakol as subscribing to Gospel anonymity are practicing Christians. And one of the reasons they give for why the Gospels were written anonymously is that this was a way for the authors to indicate that they were merely working as wills of the Holy Spirit. For example, Kurt Oland wrote, In my opinion, it is beyond doubt that all the Gospels were published anonymously. Our present opinion about their authors dates from information which derives from the time of Papias or later. Kurt Oland has a gravestone with a huge inscription which literally says Hic expectat resurrectionem or here he awaits the resurrection. As I mentioned, Gadakol correctly points out that an ancient history or biography, which is what he uses as comparanda to the Gospels, failing to explicitly name its author in the text is no indication of whether the author was identified by name in the title of the work or not. That being said, the list of specifically ancient Greek and Latin historians and biographers who do positively identify themselves by their name in the text is quite a bit longer than what Catechol reports. For example, he doesn't include Apian of Alexandria for some reason, but much more importantly, explicit identification of the author by their name in the text was perfectly common in ancient Christian biographies. Uh, you might think that Catechol doesn't include them because they post-date the Gospels, but that can't be the case because he also discusses biographies written by late ancient philosopher Porphyry, who is contemporary or even later than some of these Christian biographies. There are at least eight extant ancient Christian biographies in which the author explicitly identifies himself by his name in the text, in some cases more than once. You can see the subjects of the biographies and the authors on screen. But what's important is not that, for example, the author of the Gospel of Mark doesn't say, as for my name, it is Mark, a disciple of Peter. It's that the author never acknowledges that he has access to eyewitness testimony in all right, well, let's before we get to the eyewitness testimony, let's talk about these Christian biographies. Let's talk about um, APN of Alexandria. Stephen, what are your thoughts? But, but again, this goes back to, and, and I know that everybody wants to get into some of the biographies, the first century biographies, second century, bi et cetera. I don't think that we should focus all of our time on what kind of biography that it is. I don't think it's, I don't think it's a bad thing to note it that we do see places in biographies where people go anonymous or use different names for themselves, whether you're talking about Josephus in the wars, et cetera, Xenophon, at, as he related in his time as a philosopher. But I, I don't think that's the point here. I think that the issue that gets posed into the discussion, for me, it's about what can we connect to, 
because sometimes what we don't have is the original autographs. We don't know what was written on the outside of the manuscript. We don't know what was written on the first page of manuscripts that were given to the church. We don't know what salutation was written in addition to the text itself, um, which form it was in. There's so many what ifs that none of us on any side of the argument are going to be able to make a definitive position on that alone. That's why I don't think we can make a singularity de debate here. It has to be on what did the churches accept and what would they never have accepted? What would they have never accepted in a manuscript form? They're on high alert. We already know in the time of the apostles that they were being forged. Paul was concerned about this. Peter talks about corruptions to the word of God and to the works of Paul. We already see things happening to the text while the apostles were living. So then we got to ask ourselves, did they set in order protection where anonymous writings would never even be even considered by the church to be accepted? If they weren't accepting writings right away with apostles' names on them, how much more skeptical should they have been with writings that don't have any name on them? And we learned this from Tertullian, and I did a whole entire episode on this. It was brought up recently where we learn that Marcion's writings, when he corrupted and mutilated the Gospel of Luke, one of the things that he did is he left it anonymous, trying to slip in a similar form to Luke, but yet edited, that the churches would accept without a name. And Tertullian was basically pushing back and saying, you're a coward. What coward would ever send a document to the churches of the apostles, having left no credentials to the name? So what that tells me is Tertullian is saying that the churches would never have taken in an anonymous account. And if they would have done so, they would be foolish. They would have been out of their realm. So what they would do is they had a letter. They looked for the name first. That's what Tertullian's telling us. Then the name didn't just get a passage. We see other texts of the Gospels trying to do this. We have a Gospel of Thomas. We have other eyewitness testimony alleges from Mary. Uh, we have Judas Iscariot. We have multiple gospels with other names on it that were rejected so name only doesn't get you in but no name doesn't get you in at all then you got to compare it against the role of bishops that's what tertullian was saying we check with the earliest bishops trained by the apostles and in their day do they have in their liturgical readings their catechesis and in their instruction any of these teachings of these texts that are alleged to the apostles themselves and if they do not they are to be rejected as dangerous documents seeking to sway the church theologically or in practice. And they had these things established. And that's what Paul's talking about when he told Timothy, he has given to him a deposit to be protected and that they are to guard the deposit and not to lay hands on anyone suddenly, but only commit it unto faithful, proven people. And that's the system that was set up even when the apostles were alive. So the idea that anonymous, anonymous text would have just fluctured in and, and that these biographies are written in such a way where it's like, oh, they would have never put any kind of name on it. They had a correspondence. They had the writer. They had the deliverer of the message. I spent a lot of time explaining this through Ignatius's own writings. When you look at how they did things, they, had an anon they would never done anonymous. They had a connection between the church and the writer, and they had a trusted individual who was corresponding and delivering these messages back and forth. So just off that alone, even if there's no name on the document for the protection of the writer or the protection of the church, because it was illegal to transport these documents, if it was even a transportation protection process, you had names of individuals within the letters delivering it to the churches, protecting the institution and the writer. Mm -hmm. So there's other reasons. There's that's my point about his video. It's too vague. It's too black and white. There's multiple yeah. explanations that can be given beyond one. Sam, do you have anything you want to add to that? Or I mean, so I'm not going to be able to fall. <laughs> uh, Stephen's the. Uh, I'm just the eye candy with Stephen here. <laughs> uh, the one thing I'll just add in is with um, with what Stephen's saying. It's really important just from an evidential perspective, if you're trying to think about how you're comparing hypotheses and trying to figure out which hypothesis renders the data more probable. It, it, you can't just say, here's my hypothesis. It can vaguely explain the data, no matter how unparsimonious it might be. Therefore, yours is wrong. You're going to have to outline an argument as to like why your hypothesis is rendering the data that Stephen just pointed out more probable than the competing one. In other words, like you, you, what, what Camille or anybody that wants to deny traditional authorship has to do is say, is put up a model and not just say this explains the data, 
but also show a way that it explains the data in a more parsimonious way and with better explanatory power and scope than traditional authorship. And everything just that Stephen just pointed out falls way better in, in favor of the, of the hypothesis of traditional authorship. So I just want, like, for the audience especially, just keep thinking about that as we talk and keep going through this. So, Eric, do you want to add anything? Or if not, I've got a bunch I want to say on this whole section. Uh, no, go ahead, man. All right. So... <laughs> Uh, so you mentioned Apian of Alexandria there, and I was a little confused about what work he's referring to. Specifically, Camille said, the list of specifically ancient Greek and, and biographers who do not positively identify themselves by their name in the text is quite a bit longer than what Gathercole reports. Now, this seems to be taking Gathercole out of context. He's specifically focusing on the subgenre of biography, not historians at large. He acknowledges Correct. in other places that... A lot of times historians did mention themselves when they were writing a like a big history, for example. He's specifically going, what did biographers do? And if the Gospels are Greco-Roman biographies, which the consensus of scholars says they are, what do they do? And he notes we, there was a well-established understanding that the author in the ancient world would be anonymous. And he mentions numerous people like Tacitus or uh, Plutarch. Um, uh, Lucian at times does this. So it's just... There's very much this idea. He mentioned Apian. Now, I'm not sure what Camille's referring to. This is a problem with Camille's response, is that a lot of the points he should spend time on, he doesn't. And then he goes off these rabbit trails that are irrelevant. What are you specifically referring to? Because Apian, I, I wrote an autobiography, which we lost. Uh, Gather Cole is only focusing on known biographies from the ancient world. He's not going to focus on a biography that has been lost. And so we only know about uh, Apian's autobiography from, he mentions it in some of his other writings. We don't know how he actually wrote it beyond what could be referenced here or there and very little about it. Uh, so I don't, that's why Gather Cole left it out. It, Gather Cole was not being deceitful or stupid. He left it out because we don't have Apion's autobiography. And he's specifically focusing on biographies. That's the point. He mentions all these Christian biographies. Well, I looked at all these. I'm not sure when all these date to, but uh, they all seem to date to Constantine or later. So they all they seem fourth century or later. They're, they're all, like, they're, I don't know why you'd bring these up. A Gather Cole specifically focusing on things, uh, the culture of writing biographies in the Greco-Roman world before the Christianization of it, when the culture changes. So what? So that's why it includes Porphyry, because Porphyry is coming out of the same culture. Uh, these are all coming much later, after Constantine, after the Christianization of the empire, when the culture is shifting. So you want to yes. look at biographies and how they're going to be written in the culture the Gospels were written in, not yes. a much later culture. So this is irrelevant. The, the, bringing up Apian, bringing up these guys is irrelevant. Gather Cole specifically focusing on biography. So he's taking him out of context. Um, he's There's a shift. Bi Gather Cole is saying, let's look at what biographers do. And then Camille says, the list specifically ancient Greek and Latin historians and biographers. So Camille shifts to biographers and historians to try to make this point. So yeah. it doesn't work. Okay. So there's a lot of problems with this type of argument, but go ahead, Stephen. Yeah. Yeah. If I could add to that. So that we start seeing this in the Gnostic gospels, the genre starts changing in the second into the third century. This actually helps us date some of the Gnostic texts because you start seeing a, a shift in the culture of push. Number one, women started getting praised very, very highly in writings. They were not before at that time, including biographies done about them or to them or with them involved as eyewitness, they were not credible. By the mid to late second century, it's, it makes perfect sense why a gospel like the gospel of Mary would start to become introduced because there's almost this worship of the female uh, sex after a while, but that did not happen in the first century, but there's a major push in the second century. And so you start seeing a lot of women start getting inserted, including in Christian literature and in Gnostic literature and in Roma Greco, Roman Greco literature. So there is a change even in the second century from the first. That's what makes it so difficult, but it's also one of the things that gives away the Gnostic Gospels. The genre does change. You start seeing writers put themselves in the first person while telling the story about Jesus. I, Simon, mm -hmm. Peter, my brother, Andrew, ending the Gospel of Peter. Thomas, I did miss Thomas. You start seeing these things, and that actually helps us see the transformation of the genre between the two gospel narratives, the canonical and non-canonical, it seems to me like in the second century, mid-second century forward, we do start seeing exactly what you're talking about. 
Yeah. So we'll, let's move on here. The last thing I'll say is, again, bringing up these much later Christian biographies or Apion is irrelevant to Gallicle's point. So this is, again, doesn't really even this this argument just doesn't hold weight. But all right, let's continue on. Example, the author of the Gospel of Mark doesn't say, as for my name, it is Mark, a disciple of Peter. It's that the author never acknowledges that he has access to eyewitness testimony in any way. Some biblical scholars and all Christian apologists want to place the canonical Gospels into the same category of literature as ancient Greco-Roman historiographical works. They want to say that Mark or Matthew fundamentally pursued the same literary project and conducted similar historical investigation as Thucydides or Tacitus. But ancient historians and biographers, of course, do proactively and explicitly state that they have access to eyewitness testimony, either their own or of their sources, when they do. To illustrate how common this was, I put together a collection of passages from ancient histories and biographies in which the author talks about himself and about his access to eyewitness testimony. I only selected one passage per author, and yet there's still way too many examples for us to go over. So I'm just going to keep talking, and the video will move through the passages in a slideshow. Uh, feel free to pause it to read any given passage. The examples I collected cover both Greek and Latin authors, both historiographers and biographers, both Jewish and non-Jewish authors, and they in fact cover almost the entire canon of surviving Greco-Roman historical and biographical works. Additionally, there are several lost historians whose works only survive in fragments, and yet we still have it attested that they identified themselves as eyewitnesses in their lost works. And again, ancient Christian historians and biographers also explicitly state access to eyewitness testimony when they have it. This practice was so common that we have even examples of fictional eyewitnesses or even fictional historians who function as eyewitnesses. There are some known counterexamples, but those exist for reasons that are not applicable to the Gospels. Julius. All right, let's let's stop there. So he says that he um, doesn't have access to eyewitness. Matthew and Mark don't claim to have access to eyewitnesses. Uh, real quick, and then I'm going to go to Eric on this. Um, for one thing, he brings – this is kind of an example of seems like you're shooting yourself in your foot. You're mentioning even fictional writers do this. So this does not tell us whether the Gospels are fiction or history. It's It seems irrelevant to the main point. Uh, whether or not I, whether or not they mention they have eyewitnesses that would not be that would be a separate issue of whether or not this goes back to Matthew Mark Luke and John uh and it seems like you're shooting yourself in the foot because Luke says this John says this are you saying that those go back to eyewitnesses well no you would say that those are much later account not dependent on eyewitnesses so why even bring this up this seems to be entirely relevant to the entire point does this go back to Matthew Mark Luke and John Eric what are your thoughts I mean, when he says that all Christian apologists want to say that the Gospels are Greco-Roman biography, there's obviously, he shows uh, an unawareness that there's actually quite a bit of a debate uh, in that camp. I mean, you have like Lydia McGrew wrote a whole book saying that they're not written as ancient Greco-Roman biographies, but they are in fact reportage. And we know that they're reportage for a number of different ways, the way that they can be corroborated with um, what we know uh, about the culture of the time, the setting of the time, the history of the time, uh, the way that these authors are, the way that they interlock with one another, that shows that they're actually trying to write historical testimony. And so I, I understand that he's, I, I agree with you that he's shooting himself in the foot saying, well, even fictional writers do this and all this other kind of stuff, but it's just kind of like, what are the gospels trying to communicate? I think they're trying to communicate factual truth and they're trying, they, there's ways that we can actually corroborate that both internally and externally. Um, and we can compare it, you know, as a test case against like apocryphal gospels and things like that and find out that they don't have those kind of details. They don't have those kind of elements that we see um, in the gospels. Yeah. And so it's, it's just kind of, again, like, like you said, it's kind of a weird point to me. It, well, um, what I would, what I would say to add to what you're saying though, is like, you know, we wouldn't expect Matthew to say that he interviewed eyewitnesses if, if the gospel does go back to him, because he would be like, yeah, this is, I was there. He doesn't have to interview witnesses like Luke would, for example. And, you know, Mark is, is the church tradition is that it's the preaching of Peter. So he's going to write down what Peter was preaching. He didn't go around interviewing eyewitnesses if he's just getting his information there from Peter. Luke explicitly says this. John says he was an eyewitness. So it's like, okay, well, if, if you're just going to say that, you know, this is, this is what it would it would do. It, it you're basically giving a pass to Luke and John, which he doesn't want to do. 
Uh, you're ignoring a lot of the context around Mark and Matthew. And again, this is irrelevant to the actual question of who wrote these documents. They could be not Greco-Roman biographies, and they could still go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, they could be uh, they, they could be uh, not even based on eyewitnesses, like let's say Luke, for example, isn't it? And it could still have been written by someone named Luke, who was, you know, not actually that close to Paul, just met him once, something like that. You know, you could actually make a claim like that. Uh, Sam, what are your thoughts? Um, so this kind of ties back into one of the things that I said right away, which is just, I think a lot of Camille's argument rests on this assumption of like the Gospels being Greco-Roman biographies versus some type of a continuation of Hebrew literature. Well, to, um, to be fair, really quickly, just to be fair to Camille, he is responding to me, and I do say they are Greco. -Roman. Yeah, that's totally so fair. Just, yeah. yeah, and so so that's not me. That's not me presenting that as a knock against Camille. More so, just like I'm the, presenting another way to think about some things. And mm -hmm. ironically, um, I think it's in I, in 2014, Bart Ehrman of all people actually says something really similar. Where you know maybe these things can't, maybe the, the Gospels can't be quite put into this genre of greco-roman biographies and so ermin in this blog post actually even talks about like how these the last books of the hebrew bible are internally anonymous and mark might be just starting his gospel as a continuation of scripture and he's internally anonymous not appealing to eyewitnesses or authority or anything like that taking the words of peter now that's where Ehrman's not going to be saying something like that. That's me putting this into the theory. And the whole entire point that I'm trying to make here is that if this is the case, if this is just Hebrew literature in the form of historical reportage in the continuation of the meta narrative of scripture, I'm not really sure you were going to expect these appeals to eyewitnesses and these I statements that Camille's pointing to, because that's not in line with what you see in the Hebrew Bible either. Um, so that's one of those things where that I consider kind of a knock against this type of an argument. If that makes sense, what I'm trying to get at here. You're muted. Steven, You're muted. Yeah, Steven, do you want to add anything? If not, I will just, we'll move on to the next clip, but go ahead. No, I, I just think it goes back to my perspective is that on the gospels, three of them were worked on as a group. Um, I know that. Oh, I agree. My opinions differ for me. I think Mark is the only one that was not worked on as a group gospel. Luke collected multiple eyewitnesses. He states as much. He would have had Paul authorize his work. Uh, he traveled with Paul. And if it was Luke and it was the Luke that was with Paul, then he was traveling in Caesarea with him. He was in Jerusalem with him, mm -hmm. he was in Rome yeah. with him. He met a lot of the eyewitnesses on the way. And Luke kind of tells you who he investigated by giving them short narrative stories about themselves. Matthew, I believe, was kind of a, a probably the most difficult gospel to, to track down because I don't think it was just Matthew telling his eyewitness testimony and that's the end of the story. Right. Uh, there's multiple scenes where Matthew wouldn't have been there that yet he's recording. Uh, but it, it does appear to me that he started something that became a bigger work that was published mm -hmm. later on uh, to the Greek churches and sent from the headquarters of Jerusalem. And then John, and, and I've done an entire work on this. I think John's gospel was the Johannine community. I don't think he was the only one. I think he narrated it. I think somebody else wrote it. I think others, maybe perhaps yeah. Andrew was there. So it, again, if that's the case, we should start seeing some of these things come up. It's easier to understand if the, the, the apostles didn't work independently of each other on any mm -hmm. occasion. They were constantly working together. Even when they were separated, they'd come back for a council meeting. They would come back and meet up with people back in Jerusalem and in Antioch to make sure that they were corresponding. The apostles didn't do a lot of independent works. So it's a little bit different comparing these to an independent biography written by one of these ancient Greeks, one of these ancient Romans, because they were doing them independent. These are more collaborated works of groups of apostles and eyewitnesses with one main person doing the groundwork who gets the, probably the credit for it, like Matthew or like John. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And one thing I would say is, again, this doesn't, the point Camille's bringing up doesn't count against traditional authorship. You could make this argument against the idea that they are Greco-Roman biographies. And I would just say to that, um, books like Richard Burridge's work, What Are the Gospels, or Craig Keener's book, Christ to Biography, uh, even some of the work Mike Lacona has put out. Uh, and I, assemble that in a video I did just before this one they're responding to called what are the gospels and they just show all the evidence that there's just 
against this one point, there's so much evidence stacked up in favor of them being Greco-Roman biographies. Yes, a lot of ancient Greco-Roman biographies reported by witnesses, but that wasn't a necessary feature of them. Uh, so there's just so many other points uh, to sh support the whole thing. So with that, let's keep moving on here. Let me see here. What is my next timestamp? So I'm going to play a little bit more, and then I'm going to uh, jump ahead a little bit. But um, yeah, again, we're just going to try to hit the main points. Julius Caesar refers to himself in the third person in his commentary, except for one passage. And Xenophon apparently wrote his Anabasis under a pseudonym. In both cases, this is because they are the main characters, and their works continuously describe their own military victories and other accomplishments. So it would be perceived as too self-congratulatory for them to constantly refer to their successes in the first person. This would only be comparable to the Gospels if they were written by Jesus himself. There are also some fragments of lost histories in which the author refers to himself in the third person. For example, 3rd century general Herennius Dexippus. But because we don't have their works preserved, we don't know whether the author identified himself elsewhere in the text. Just like... All right, with that, I mean, the point I would respond to that really quickly, and then I'm going to let you guys have it out, is that uh, he talks about how, like, you know, someone like Caesar would, would not be mentioning himself because it could not be it could be considered a little too boastful i guess was his main point but you could make the same point i remember ep sanders talking a little bit about this it's it would be if you're trying to focus on the work of god in your belief system and the work of christ you don't want to be making references to yourself in a biography especially if your main focus is on what jesus specifically did so that can also help push the gospels to be very very anonymous in this focus more on jesus and not be focusing on like you know, what, what they're doing in the story, how they're interacting in the story, that's going to pull focus away from Jesus. So if you already have that cultural expectation, the cultural expectation of being anonymous in works like this, it can really push the gospel authors in their Christian communities to be more and more anonymous. So I don't see this as, again, a point. But again, this isn't even a point against traditional authorship. Eric, do you Any want to points? go? Go ahead, Stan. You go first. Yeah, all I was just going to say is I, I I agree. I'm not really seeing a lot. <laughs> no, I mean I just told. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> I'm just uh I'm not seeing like a logical connection from what Camille is saying to the gospel authors. Like he's just kind of pointing out, hey, this is how this is treated, and then just leaving out the extra part of the argument that's needed, which is like, why is it the case that necessarily the gospel authors would do X when Xenophon did why or something like that. Like, I'm not really seeing the logical connection at the end of the day. That's all I really wanted to say. It's why can't the why can't the gospel authors not follow this trend that Camille is observing in these other writings? Right. All right, Eric, why don't you go and then we'll move on to the next clip. Uh no, I, I just agree. Um, I, I don't think that there's anything with the the whole third person kind of kind of thing there. Uh, even in Matthew's account, um, a lot of times people will bring up, well, why is Matthew just taking his own calling um, from Mark's gospel and retelling the story almost word for word if he was really there? Like, why would he even do that? But if you actually look at some of the verbal differences, Matthew basically omits himself completely out of the story. He doesn't draw attention to the grandness of the event. Um, there are like these kind of little indicators of him trying to kind of take himself out of the story even more so uh, than what you would see in the other synoptics. And so, um, so yeah, just, just tacking that, that point on there real quick. Yeah. Awesome guys. All right. I'm going to again move ahead a little bit like this. I'm going to play the next clip and go ahead and mute your mics. If you guys want to talk, just unmute your mic and then I'll know to come to you. So, all right, let's, let's go. For works of historical fiction, for example, the Alexander Romans or various lives of Aesop or some ancient novels, it's difficult to overstate how significant this observation is for the question of gospel authorship. Greco-Roman historians and biographers who conduct actual historical investigation and who do have access to eyewitness testimony consistently write entirely differently from how Mark or Matthew are written. This is the real problem of gospel anonymity. If the Gospels followed the same literary practices as ancient historiography, we would absolutely expect the Gospel of Mark to say, and Jesus saw Simon, who gave this testimony, or the Gospel of Matthew to say, and he saw a man named Matthew, the author of this account. 
explicit declaration of eyewitness testimony is of course also very common in later Christian apocrypha. We know of some 20 ancient apocryphal works in which the author explicitly communicates access to eyewitness testimony in the text. Uh, you can see their titles on the screen. So why is it the case that these writings conform to what we expect to see in Greco-Roman historiography better than two of the canonical Gospels? Well, it's because they were written later, at a time when it became important to establish apostolic authority. It's not surprising that it's precisely the two earliest Gospels, Mark and Matthew, that make absolutely no mention of having access to eyewitness testimony. It's only... All right, let's stop there. Okay, so he makes the argument that Matthew should have, like, made a nudge to himself or Mark should have made a nudge to Simon Peter. Stephen, you I knew I was going to come to you right away as soon as I hit stop. So go for it. Yeah, I it goes back to what was the purpose of these gospels. The gospels are that the churches did initially not want written accounts. They would rather hear the accounts from the apostles themselves. We see this in Papias. Papias says that he would rather hear things from the living and abiding voices those that were actually there. Who wouldn't? We would rather have the living abiding voices in the written accounts. If we have the opportunity to have a recording of Peter, we'd rather listen to Peter live than read an account that transcribes his sermon. We'd rather hear the sermon of Peter. Now, with that being said, what became the problem that forced the apostles to start writing the texts? Well, death. That's a big one. They're not going to live forever, and their accounts die with them if they are not put to transmission. What we see in the Gospel of John, and we also even see with Peter, with the Gospel of Mark, is that they did not initially want to actually do any of these works. Uh, naturally, Peter and John being fishermen probably aren't going to be big on this kind of a concept of, yeah, let's write an account. Paul, sure, why not? But not Peter and not John. And, it, and if we actually look at the history that's stated like in the Muratorian Fragment, or if we go into the Anti-Marcionite Prologue about John's Gospel specifically, we find that it took elders in Ephesus to push him to even narrate something because mm -hmm. they would rather have had a, a oral tradition than a written tradition, but they're going to die. And if Peter's in Rome, he's constantly in jeopardy. People started wanting this to become, hey, if, if Peter's killed, we got to have something here. His message dies with him. So the, the, the goal of Mark there would not be, hmm, how can I fit myself into this scenario or fit Peter into this scenario as much as possible and make a bold declaration? Matthew would have not done the same thing. Again, Matthew, we don't know what maybe the earliest form of Matthew looked like. I personally believe he collected sermons of Jesus that consisted of the major ones, like the Olivet Discourse, Sermon on the Mount, prayers like the Lord's Prayer, these would have been things that Matthew would have recorded initially on, just collecting major things that the churches were using and reciting. Then it required a better and a more full account to be distributed from Jerusalem, which would have been other eyewitnesses and apostles that were still abiding in the city at that time. And they would have uh, corroborated together. They would have used Mark's eyewitness testimony uh, recordings of Peter because he's a star witness and there for things that Matthew wasn't. It had been a group effort to put something out. Their job there is not to send out a letter from Matthew. Their job is to send a letter and an account from the church of Jerusalem that is authenticated by its eyewitnesses. And that would have been the priority. So for Matthew to slop his name all over the paper and to make it about him or anybody else that was in Jerusalem would have misdirected the churches with the motive and purpose behind the account. Mark would have been the only one, the only one that had any reason to emphasize and push a singular writer. And he did. He emphasized Peter 10 to one over any other person in the apostolic group. There's people that we don't even know about in Mark's gospel that are a part of the apostolic group. There's just a, they're just in a list that get major speaking parts in John, or they get small speaking parts in, in the, in Matthew and in Luke. And then you find there's other characters that are involved in scenes that Luke tells us about that Mark didn't tell us anything about at all because it is singular in a singular way pointing to one person's perspective, mindset, and ideas. And the whole narrative shifts on whether Peter understands something about Jesus or misunderstands something about Jesus.
whether Peter get, is, is getting a message from Jesus on behalf of the apostles or vice versa. It is all through Mark's gospel, singling out a single apostle's motives, thoughts, directions, journeys, conversion, repentance, restoration, all fitted into Peter. And it ends with Peter and it starts with Peter. That's not true of Matthew. It's definitely not true of John. John tells us that later on that Peter wasn't even introduced to Jesus until his brother sent him over. And it word order changes the brothers. It's Andrew and his brother, Simon, mm -hmm. whereas in Mark, it's Simon, then his brother, Andrew, changes his whole trajectory. And even when Peter is first introduced to Jesus in the gospel of John, he gets no speaking parts. Jesus says something to Peter, but John doesn't even report anything that Peter says back to Jesus. It's only Andrew and it's only the anonymous disciple that gets any words said to Jesus in the first section. We see a major shift in the accounts, and that has to do with the point of emphasis, the audience, and the message that the churches are trying to receive. This is new for the churches to get written accounts when they're used to receiving verbal accounts and oral sermons from the apostles. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about what Camille said here a little bit. He, so he said like, you know, why doesn't Matthew say, you know, like I, I wrote this when Matthew's introduced. Well, again, he acknowledged early that uh, when he was talking about Simon Gathercole's paper that, yeah, often these biographers would write anonymously like Tacitus, for example, or, you know, uh, other writers would do similar things, but it was not always required. We see ancient writers are writing in third person constantly. So Thucydides, uh, in chapter 14 of the history of Pel Pel the Peloponnesian War says, in this way, they gave up the city and late in the same day, Thucydides and his ships entered the harbor of Eon, Brazidas having just got hold of Amphalus, probably butchering those town names. But why didn't he say, I fit it, Thucydides entered the harbor? Xenophon, there was in the army a certain Xenophon, an Athenian who accompanied the army neither as a general, nor as a captain, nor as a private soldier. I mean, you see similar things in Josephus' Jewish Wars. Uh, this Scythia, I, the guy who, printed, wrote, who um, wrote that starts with names with a D, like Dexippus. I forget how to pronounce it. And Nicolaus's history. We see them writing in third person constantly. So th there's a, there's already a cultural standard there. It's not that they have to do this. And again, if, if Camille already acknowledged when he was talking about Gather Cole in the opening, that yeah, they often did write anonymously, didn't mention themselves in the biography. Why would we now say that oh, they should be mentioning themselves? It, doesn't really make sense. Well, Our and think, and just real quick, you know, we have indications of this with Matthew that other people had their hands on the account. We have records of Barnabas. We have records of James the Just. We have records. I mean, we have multiple statements in history that other individuals that we would associate with the Church of Jerusalem and Antioch who had their hands on this. So no, Matthew would not just throw his name singularity into the text if other people did actually have their hands on the text like some of the early, like Epiphanius tells us about this. We have others that remark that even John, the apostle himself may have been involved in the gospel of Matthew. So if that's the case, I mean, my, I mean, that's, that's my thing is if that, if it wasn't a singular person, why would they singularity insert their name? The question then becomes is why does a single name get associated with Matthew? If he did the groundwork for it and it began with his initial research, he would be getting the credit for it. Just like John got the credit for the gospel of John, because he was the mayor name, uh, main narrator, but there are others that are surrounded with him also telling their story as we see in the Muratorian fragment, the Antimarsian prologue. So again, why would one person singularity put their name into it when they know they're working with a, a group of people who are also inserting their story and fact checks into the narrative as well? It wouldn't make sense to do that. Right. All right. Let's get to the next timestamp here. Didascalia Apostolorum, if the four canonical gospels were really written by their traditional authors, it's entirely inexplicable why Mark and Matthew never acknowledge that they have access to eyewitness testimony in any way, but Luke and John do. In fact, I would say that if Mark and Matthew really are both accounts of one person's eyewitness testimony, their total silence about this is entirely unparalleled in all known ancient Greco-Roman historiographical and biographical literature. And if not, the ratio of typical versus exceptional cases is going to be something like a hundred to one against Mark and Matthew. But all right, Stephen, you kind of already have addressed that. If there's anything else you wanted to say on that, I mean, go for it. Uh, again, it, it, I would just, again, quickly say, again, it's about what their purposes were. If Mark is not going around interviewing eyewitnesses like 
the tradition that we cited says, he's just getting his stuff from Peter. Uh, he's not going to be saying, yes, I went around and interviewed like all these people and did that, did that work. Uh, but again, his work from people like Richard Bauckham is noted with the inclusio starting with Peter and ending with Peter. It would align with that traditional account of citing eyewitnesses. Uh, Bauckham also brings up an interesting point in uh, one of Caesar's, um, uh, one of Plutarch's works. He mentions a guy whose name is Asinus Polio in the account of Caesar. And he just sort of mentions him in there uh, without saying that he's getting his information from this guy. But Bauckham makes a pretty good case that this is who the account is coming from. This is why he's just sort of mentioned sort of off the cuff as being there because there's no reason for him to be there other than, hey, he want, he, Plutarch wants to assure his readers that he's not making this up. You know, Pulio was there. This is who he's getting his information from. But go ahead, Stephen, what were you going to say? No, I, I was just going to reiterate, you know, I think this is the, the dynamic of the video. Again, a well done video. But it goes back to there's a lot of black and white here where there's a ton of ground to just right. be worked into because we're categorically putting all the gospels the same. Well, if the gospels were like these other texts, then they should represent this. It's like, but you're treating Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as if they don't have distinct audience, distinct backgrounds, distinct purposes, distinct locations, and distinct messages. Although their overarching goal is the same, it's to proclaim what happened to Jesus, what he said, what he did, what happened to him. That's the goal of all of them. But that's not the intentionality and the distribution of them being the same. So therefore, to put all four Gospels into a single category of that you have to fit these kind of descriptions to be comparable to Xenophon or to Pluto, whatever. I mean, when you start getting into that, we start losing the value of each individual gospel because we, we have to take them one at a time, especially if some of the tradition is coming from these eyewitnesses, some are coming from these eyewitnesses. One of them is being associated with Paul's ministry journeys. One of them is being associated with Peter's ministry journeys. We should expect major distinctions, though unanimity in them, but also distinction because of their purpose and their usage and their distribution. So I don't like it when we try to put, well, if the gospels are this, then all of these in history should be, well, they're all different. They're all distinct. I don't think we should just categorically put them in the same, in the same group like that. Yeah. And if Eric and Than, if you guys want to comment, just unmute yourself and I'll come to you. But um, yeah, I would just say that when historians like Richard Byrd say that the gospels are Greco Roman biographies, they don't say there's a very rigorous way to do it. They, they know there's there's a lot of flexibility in that genre. And sometimes they go over to other genres. Like he talked about Luke being kind of like not just a biography, but also a history. It's it's sort of like is kind of towing the line between these two different genres. It's not yes. just strictly something. But yeah, go ahead, fam. What were you going to add? Oh, all I was going to do is just say back up what Stephen was saying just now, which is like that's my biggest gripe with this argument is just we're all we're treating the gospels as if there's the same exact type of document as all of these other greco-roman lit like pieces of literature and it, i what i feel like i really want from camille is an argument as to why we should treat them like that like that's i feel like the missing piece of the puzzle of his argument that i really want like i'm just sitting here wanting more from the argument, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, before I go to you, Eric, I just want to say again, this this doesn't really threaten traditional authorship. The main point of the video, he's supposed to be showing us that the gospel is originally anonymous, and all everything he's saying could be true. They're not Greco-Roman biographies, or they don't they don't really fit that genre, and they can still go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This this doesn't even threaten the main point. Got Eric. Right. No, and and it's again, like I said, it's just how can we look at to see if they are historical? Um, like what are the markers of testimony that are in them? I mean, we're saying, well, he doesn't cite his sources. Okay. Like did, did he, was, was he in the place? Was he at the time? Does he show familiarity with the geography, the customs, the culture? Um, is there other marks of this being eyewitness testimony? Because if it is, then the idea that apostles wrote down a gospel or companions of the apostles wrote down a gospel is not really a far-fetched thing, if you know what I'm saying. And so, like, he's saying, well, they don't list these sources, and so therefore, you know, whatever. But it's like, well, we have all this other information uh, of what they were trying to communicate, how they were effectively communicating it. 
that they are interested in factual truth. Um, Luke is giving explicit statements that he's interviewing, um, you know, people, he's collecting testimony. He's in the places at the time, as Stephen alluded to before, where like if he is a traveling companion with Paul and there's an avalanche of evidence that supports that, then he is in Jerusalem. He does have access to witnesses um, while Paul is in prison. He was in Sarasaria Maritima, which is just 75 miles away. He has access to these people. And so uh, to me, it's like, I agree with you guys that some of these points seem a little bit irrelevant. They don't yeah. deny yeah. the uh, traditional authorship. And like, you have to look at this other information too. You can't just be like, well, they don't, they don't talk to, they don't name their sources. And, and, and just right. to add to that, I think it's important to note that Luke actually gives evidence of doing this in the, we, us and our passages, the writer, you find him in Caesarea with Philip and the four and his four virgin daughters and all of a sudden, you know, the narrative in Acts shifts away from Peter, goes away to a random guy named Philip who runs into this random Ethiopian eunuch uh, while he was over there randomly in Samaria. And you ask yourself, well, where did this story come from? But then we see within the narrative, Luke in his travels with Paul spent the night and had dinner with Philip and his four daughters in Caesarea. So he was there with the guy. So then you go, okay, so where did the material of chapter eight of Acts come from? Well, it had been from the night that he stayed at the man's house. So, I mean, that's just one example that happens all the time in Luke and Acts. You find this correspondence where if he's with Paul, he would have received like the, the, the prayer of Mary. How in the world would he have received that prayer? Well, either A, he ran into her himself or B, he ran into uh, James, one of the family members, <laughs> when he was with Paul in Jerusalem and we see that Paul went back to Jerusalem and the, we, us, our guy is with him and would have spent time with James the, the, in the family of Jesus and would have been able to receive that information. So this isn't far fetched. Like he was in the right place at the right time to get that kind of content from the right people. All right. Yeah. All right. Let's move ahead to the next clip here. Uh, here we go. Just one, but two false dichotomies. First, a title was not the only means of identifying an ancient work. Other options include, most importantly, the insipid or the opening words. And second, it's obviously not the case that a title must necessarily include the name of the author. There is, of course, no shortage of ancient works that were either identified by their insipid or they had a title, but their author is not known. This includes, for example, several books of the Bible. And we can also see that before the surviving titles of the canonical Gospels were first used, other Gospel texts had titles that didn't include the author's name either. The Marcionite Gospel was just titled Evangelio, good news, and Marcion didn't attribute it to any author. Irenaeus claims that the Valentinians titled a Gospel text the Gospel of Truth. Much later, we see the same phrase in the insipid of one Nakamadi text which is lacking a title, by the way. And of course, other ancient Christians had no problem referring to gospel texts without naming an author. For example, to the gospel according to the Hebrews. The Dead Sea Scrolls community didn't seem to attach authors' names to their parabiblical writings either. They just used titles like the community rule. And many other Nag Hammadi texts don't have any known authors. Instead, they are just called the exegesis of the soul or the wisdom of Jesus Christ. And there is actually some evidence that the canonical goes. All right, before we get to that, let, let's address this really quickly here. Um, a lot I want to say on this, um, but Stephen, you, you're unmuted. So why don't you go at first and then I'll, I'll jump in after that. This goes back to why do these texts have to, have to have the inscriptions exactly. when it's already known, especially with the Old Testament text, like he's giving examples of there. Um, the, the thing is like when, when somebody referred to Torah, you didn't have to put Moses's name in there, the Torah of Moses, <laughs> the law of Moses. They already knew what you were talking about. And we see this breakdown in the very earliest transmission of the New Testament through the bishop's chain of custody. He gives the example of Marcion. This is what Tertullian was talking about with Marcion. There should be a chain of custody and a chain of connectivity between the apostles, their students, and their distribution of the apostles' work. Which church, which churches were reading which texts? Well, they were reading the writings of Paul. And a lot of times, and this isn't hard. If anybody studies any of the early patristics, it'll say the apostle says, and then it'll quote Paul. It's like, why did you just say Paul? 
or or it'll say that the, in, it is in the gospels. It'll just say gospels, or it'll say gospel singular. It won't even say which one. And we have to ask ourselves, why is that the case? Two reasons, in my opinion, guys, and I want your feedback on this. Number one, in the liturgical readings of the scripture, we we see in the early church, most believers that sat in a church service did not have a copy of the word of God. They're not looking at a written text. There's typically just a handful of written texts within a room of a church, and the, the president or the priest is up there reading the text for the liturgical reading. Most of the early church was working off memorization to sit there and say, our gospel reading is this. And then it reads from Matthew. It's like, well, why did the priest say Matthew? By the way, liturgy still worked that way this day, whether you're Greek Orthodox or any kind of Orthodox or Anglican mm -hmm. or Catholic, the, they get up there. And even, even to this day in, in, in my congregation, one of the priests will come up, he's holding the four gospels. It's just four gospels, holds it up in the air and says, the gospel of the Lord, but it's all four. And it'll say, we're reading from the gospel of the Lord, singular gospel, but it's four gospels mm -hmm. and they all have names. The same thing would have been happening. They're not looking to like, how, all right, so if we want Matthew to have written this, so let's throw Matthew's name on this. They didn't care about whether it came from Matthew. They cared about, did it come from the church of Jerusalem or from the apostolic group there or from the eyewitnesses? And once the churches received these gospels and they already knew who to ascribe them to, why do they have to constantly throw Matthew's name on it all the time? There's no need for it. They saw it as an authentic text that was sent from mother churches or from the apostles themselves. That's all they needed. Whether or not Matthew was the penman or a partial authority or a partial eyewitness blended in with James and whoever else, that's irrelevant to the people that are just sitting in a congregation in service that day who are hearing and trying to get news of Jesus that is in written form that most of them probably can't read or personally own a copy of. So they're going to sit there and they're going to listen to the oral reading of the word of God. And they're going to try to memorize it as much as possible as the teachings of Jesus or as the teachings of the apostles. Their goal wasn't to sit here and just constantly have to put these names in it. And I think there's an obsession with that in this video. It's like, put yourself in real time, real place, real issues. That's not the way it would have worked. It doesn't work that way in, in, in mass at a Catholic church or in our Anglican congregations. We still don't explicitly name every single gospel writer. We sp well, explicitly call it the gospel. Well, I mean, it, you can also look at Paul's letters. I mean, he, sometimes he's just saying the scriptures say this or that. He doesn't have to say, this Absolutely. comes directly from Isaiah. Uh, he makes a comparison with the community notes or the community rules of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, that was specifically for the community. They're not sending this out and they need to prove it goes back to the community. That's just for their very specific community there at Qumran. It's not going to be something that is going to be going out for some sort of apologetic purpose. He also makes a comparison with the Marcion gospel and some of the other, I believe he used another Gnostic gospel. gospel there. This one really Gospel of truth. Yeah, this, this one really caught me. And I don't think this is a fair comparison for a number of reasons. For one, when Marcion tries to sneak in his anonymous gospel, the church fathers lose their minds. They go, what uh -huh. are you like Tertullian, Irenaeus? They're like, what are you doing? We don't, we don't take anonymous gospels. We go back to the ones that can go back. They can trace back to an authority figure an apostle or someone who followed them. They're very clear that like, and, you know, prior to that, they had no reason to mention the gospel authorship because no one was trying to sneak in an anonymous gospel. The moment someone tries, they're like, uh-uh, we only use the ones that come from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they all unanimously agree on this. So that needs to be said. But also comparing the Marcians to the Orthodox Christians is not a fair comparison. Let me just give an analogy. I, I've been dealing on TikTok with some crazy people, a lot of them Gnostic leaning type folk, people that are like, did you hear what the gospel of Thomas said? And when I respond to them, I'm always like, you do not realize the scholarship on this is pretty well established this dates to the second century. Uh, or they'll bring up the gospel of Mary. And I'm like, that's very late. Like, there's no reason to think this goes back. A lot of these type, these Gnostic type folk, these esoteric type folk, they don't really put a lot of stock in tradition. They put a stock in what they can find that's going to match their, their mystical ideas or their mystical teachings. 
Marcion is sort of falling in that same category. He's rejecting the Old Testament. He's rejecting uh, anything that looks Jewish because he's got some sort of mold he wants to fit. So he's not giving stock to tradition. He's he's more in that Gnostic type category where it's about finding things that fit the esoteric beliefs that you want to conform to. Whereas the church was very much, we're not going to get rid of the Jewish scriptures. The, this is the tradition that came down to Jesus and the apostles and came down to us. We're going to keep them and we're going to work with them. They're very much following, hey, what did the apostles preach? Hey, here are our sources. You know, for one point, like uh, Irenaeus cites like all the works of Papias um, to back up his point, like all like he's a, it's like a five volume thing, for example. He says um, in I believe it's book five, 13, he says, and these things are are bound witness to the writings by Papias, the hearer of John and a companion of Polycarp in his fourth book, for there were five books compiled by him. So you see this sort of precedent, like, let's go back to the traditions. Let's see what people actually taught and let's go from there. To compare them to what Gnostic groups were doing, there was a whole different agenda there. This is not a good comparison. So, all right, with that, I'm going to hit, hit play unless any of you guys want to jump in. But other than that, let's keep rolling. Go Gospels originally had these kinds of titles. Specifically, the first verse of the first chapter in the Gospel of Mark is not a sentence. It doesn't have any word. It says, Archetu Evangeliu Jesu Christu, or the origin of the good news of Jesus the Messiah. That's a title. Similarly, the first verse of the first chapter in the Gospel of Matthew isn't a sentence. It says, Biblos Geneseos Jesu Christu, Huiu David, Huiu Abraham, or the book of the origin of Jesus the Messiah, son of David, son of Abraham. That's a title. And we even see some evidence that before gospel titles were standardized in the 2nd century, the title of this anonymous book was unstable. The Didache, which I've already mentioned, refers to material appearing in the Gospel of Matthew, but it cites it as To Evangelion to Kuryu Hemon, or the Good News of Our Lord. That's the title. Similarly, when Justin Martyr uses material which we can recognize in the canonical gospels, he calls it Apomneumata ton apostolor, which is usually translated as apostolic memoirs. And he actually repeats this specific phrase so many times that some scholars think this is a book title. Apomneumata is. All right, let's stop there. Let's talk about a little bit about, about these titles. I know, Stephen, you and I were talking a little bit about this beforehand. Than you were also talking about it. So either of you guys want to go, go for it. Dan, you want to start? start? Uh, I mean, I, all I'll say is just I think I think he's right about the Gospel of Mark. I think, and yeah. you guys might disagree with me, but I think I, I think a better the better translation is the beginning of the good news, um, rather than the origin of the good news. Um, and I think that's a title that of Mark, but I don't I don't know how that is somehow evidence against traditional authorship either. Right. Uh, so. <sighs> It goes back to what I was saying. I, I don't see that as a problem. I see that as sensible. Um, these writings are intended to be the life, ministry, and teachings of Jesus that are given to the churches because the apostles are dying off. The oral tradition time is over. And these authorized texts are being distributed to their proper churches with the chain of custody of the writer the message that's being delivered and the church that's going to receive it. They know where it came from. There is such a thing as community assumptions. Uh, for example, if I'm on this podcast right now and I'm sitting here having a conversation with you guys and saying the president of the United States made a statement yesterday, do I really have to say Joe Biden? We as American citizens assume when I say the president of the United States, you know who I'm talking about because we all are familiar with what's currently going on. When these people are alive and the apostles are writing these texts, they don't have to specify themselves constantly or their individuals that are in their groups. It is good enough to make as long as it's actually from the, the apostolic group that are delivering these messages, these letters, these epistles, these gospels, these accounts, as long as that it's traceable to them, you have the church they started, the congregants they they discipled, the leaders they left there that they were discipling to go and minister to these churches, their correspondence with those that they trained and receiving the messages from them that these are the deposits given to their successors, whether it's Timothy, whether it's Titus, 
whether it's Apollos, whoever else you want to list in the category, they have these individuals of these churches. They're giving them these letters and they're saying, commit this to faithful men, teach this to faithful people, continue this on. Or like the church of Colossae, take this letter and transcribe it, send it over to Laodicea. If that is the instruction that these individuals are giving, these apostles or leaders of the churches are giving, the assumption of the church is when they're reading the gospel of Mark, it's not about Mark. It's not even about Peter's sermon anymore. It's This is the message of the Lord because they trust that Peter gave them what he heard. And therefore, when Peter is, is preaching, Jesus went over to Galilee and he said these things to these people, they're assuming that Peter who heard that is telling them what Jesus said. Therefore, it is the gospel of the Lord. It is the gospel and the lineage or the genealogy of Jesus because they're, they are trusting the message has been transmitted over to a written text. They are now hearing the verbal reading of these texts that were once preached throughout the entire uh, Roman providence at that time. Now they're getting it in a written form. There's so much that they already know to be true that doesn't require a bunch of repeat over and over again from the names. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Eric, and then I'll jump in. Oh, there's some yeah. stuff I wanted to say. Just noting one thing, I'm going back to uh, the idea that there's the uh, Mark is, is based on the testimony of Peter. There is one spot, just since he brought up Justin Martyr, where he actually, he refers to it as the memoirs of the apostles, like he stated, but he also at one point, I believe it's in the dialogue of Trypho, he refers to it yeah. as one of the gospels is the memoirs of Peter. Yes. And he's, uh, out of the passages that Justin cites from the gospel of Mark, one of them is um, referring to like the sons of thunder, like that's only found in the gospel of Mark. Yep. And so it's just kind of like extra evidence that supports the idea that these aren't just like memoirs of the apostle, bam, that's a title. That's also, there's one that he refers to as the memoirs of Peter. And it seems pretty obvious that he's referring to the gospel of Mark. So I just wanted to toss that. But, but to, but to go in into that before, Mike, before you jump in there, to add to what he's saying, remember the statement that he used about the, um, the memoirs of the apostles. What context did Justin Martyr use that in? Public liturgical readings. Because right. he also mentions that they're reading the prophets in that sermon or in that Sunday before the sermon comes to explain and exposit those memoirs. So you have a circumstance with Eric's example, and it's a great one, Eric, that he one minute says and gives context to Peter and his memoir when explicitly stating the passage. But when he refers to the public reading of them in a whole, he doesn't individualize the name. He just calls it the memoirs of the apostles. What's the context of Justin Martyr saying that? He says it in the liturgical readings in front of the church, which is an assumed community that already knows where they came from. Just like when he says they read the prophets in the very next line, memoirs of the apostles and the prophets, he doesn't have to specify, oh, they read Isaiah, they read Jeremiah, they because the church community is assumed to know when they start reading the words of Isaiah 53 that he's reading from the prophet Isaiah. It's assumed within the community. Does that does that make sense? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And, you know, when Justin Martyr refers to that, it's in Dialogue of Trypho 106.3. Correct. Uh, and so, but all, I mean, for example, Craig Evans in his book, uh, Jesus and the Manuscript, says... The important point here is that memoirs are not anonymous. They're linked to known personalities. You're not going to call something a memoir of someone if it's not linked to these personalities. And that's the point he goes in there. These would not have been anonymous if they're memoirs of someone. And it's interesting that Justin says they're memoirs of the apostles and those who followed them. Two of the, two of the gospels are attributed to apostles and two are attributed to men who follow them. That aligns perfectly with the unanimous attestation this goes back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And if Justin is calling them the, the memoirs of Peter, for example, and Camille's going to make the point that this tradition of it going back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John goes to a tradition in Rome. He's going to posit this later. But if why not just call it the gospel of Peter? Why are you downgrading it to the gospel of Mark, to someone yep. who followed him? That's not, that's not a good apologetic if you're going out there, especially when the Marcionites come on it. Oh, no, we've got one directly from Peter himself. No, they... They stick to the tradition. This goes back to what Mark wrote. 
Uh, with regards to him mentioning these being titles, uh, like that opening line of Mark, that's perfectly consistent with Gather Cole's paper and what he was arguing. Gather Cole says in his paper, for example, um, he says ancient works were often I would, would often identify the author in an external fashion. Um, I'm paraphrasing, by the way, like in a title, subscription, main uh, above the main body, that is, or in a table of contents, a running header, an end title on the title page, a tag, and or on a flyleaf cover in the front. And we know that a lot of the early manuscripts that we have um, have this flyleaf attached to them. So you could have that opening line in Mark, and then you could also have the flyleaf title or the flyleaf mentioning of who the actual author is or where the tradition comes from. There were multiple ways. So Gather Cole's aware of this. He's aware of the fact that there were just multiple ways that the author could originally have identified them. So again, none of this, again, up until this point, nothing Camille has given is really inconsistent with the main point that the Gospels go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We could concede all his points. Yes, yes. Uh, we could still make the case that they go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is the problem with arguing against traditional authorship. A lot of the arguments are just missing the mark entirely. So with that, let's continue on here. I moved ahead to the next timestamp here. Uh, this is something I wanted Stephen's comments on specifically. His Gospels, and not just the four canonical Gospels, are titled using the Greek preposition kata plus a noun in the accusative case. So according to Philip, or according to the Hebrews. In titles of ancient literary works, this specific formula was used for version control. It was used to differentiate between several existing versions of the same text. In all known instances, the formula was not applied by the author, but by someone else later. There are many different examples of this practice. The first is the poetry of Homer. Textual critical alterations of the works of Homer were done already by ancient readers. Most typically, some verses were excised because they were considered inauthentic. Different people, of course, had different ideas about what was inauthentic, which resulted in various different versions of the epics. So the formula was used to differentiate between these versions. Another example are medical texts. Okay, uh, so Stephen, you and I were talking about it a little bit beforehand uh, about the, the Kata uh, title. Uh, I didn't, again, didn't really see this as much of a problem considering it's it, they're talking about specifically the good news or the gospel, according to. So you would expect that variation version to apply here if that's what they're focused on. But what were your thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I, I think it goes what you just said. Where, where would we, I, I, I almost, maybe you guys can, you guys might know him better. Where is he trying to draw a, a argument against ours here? Like where would be the cutting edge that says this is where you're wrong? Because when I when I went back over this section again, I thought to myself, okay, he doesn't know me probably. And he probably, if he knew me, he would know I would say, that's cool. I'm fine with that. Like, I mean, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't, just because it has the, the preposition and the ownership concept there, so where would he push back? You guys might know better than me. Like Eric, uh, you, you follow. I'm, I'm, I'm as confused as you are on this, how this is supposed to be an argument against traditional authorship. I don't see this as a main point. Again, if, if you're talking about specifically the gospel of Jesus, uh, you're, the, the according to title seems to fit well because it's going to be the version that comes through Mark and then Matthew and then Luke. That that just fits again with the tradition. That Again, this is not an argument against traditional authorship. Well, so I thought... You know, like I, I was, that's why I'm deferring to you to maybe understand yeah. what, what his argument is supposed to be. So to me, even if you go to the book, let's say, let's leave the gospels, go to Revelation. In Revelation one, it's always called the apocalypse of John. Most, most commonly it's called the apocalypse of John. The first line of the book of Revelation actually says it's the apocalypse of Jesus Christ, but it's mm -hmm. always called the apocalypse of John. It's a, it's a, it's, it's, uh, inscriptions are typically given to John. The apocalypse is written right on there. And then a lot of attribution is given to John on the manuscript tradition. But yet the very first line says that the vision was given to John, but that this was the revelation of Jesus Christ. So I don't see, so to me, it's like, okay, can you have both? Can you have the revelation of Jesus? And also it be the apocalyptic, the apocalyptic vision of John. It was because John received it on the island of Patmos who delivered it to the seven churches of Asia minor. 
in relation to what Jesus, who was and is and is to come, says to the churches throughout all ages. And so therefore, it is the apocalypse of John receiving the apocalypse of Jesus. So if it is of Jesus Christ, Mark 1 or Matthew 1, can it also be the gospel of Matthew or according to Matthew or the gospel of Mark or according to Mark? Of course it can. It can be both. We see that in the book right. of Revelation. It's no different. Yeah, it, it's not an either or. And so, in, again, it's it's nothing inconsistent with Catherine Cole's point that these would not have been sent out anonymous. And so there's a lot of issues there. Well, the, the uh, question again, is because why did it have to be pushed with names on it? And I think that goes back to what I was saying a minute ago. You have common uh, known things about these texts in the earliest stages. Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Ignatius. A lot of things were already assumed in the second century. And so once these texts started becoming more distributed and further out to churches that did not have the assumed knowledge, it is mandated that they start actually putting more succinct identification to them when transmitting them and sending them out. Because, okay, so let's say Matthew's gospel. I, I think multiple people are part of it, but he was probably the main worker that mm -hmm. published That's the gospel. Same view. Same, so, view, same view I have, yeah. There you go. And so with him, he would receive the most credit for it because it's traceable to his origin. If it was his idea or his initial collection, whatever it is. So you label it to him. If John was the narrator behind the gospel of John, even though Andrew and maybe other elders were there, but you want to assume it to John because of credibility or to Peter because of credibility, whatever you got to do to John Mark who was with him, that that's the way to do it because the more audiences and the more churches that grow and the further the gospel is going around the world, the less the assumed knowledge becomes and is paramount that those churches that are taking the letters they directly received from the apostles because they knew the apostles, they spent time with the apostles. They were being taught and pastored by the apostles, his own disciples. As that connection starts getting lesser and a new person comes in or a new church over here and a new church over there, it becomes paramount that you actually become more clear on this on the assumed knowledge this community has to make sure the next community has that same assumption because they won't have the same assumption, so they have the same contact and the same point of reference, Matthew, John, Luke. And, and it, by the way, again, it gives them no credibility, like you said, putting Luke and Mark on there are lesser. You would put Paul and you'd put Peter on there if you wanted to do that. But if it originated with the work of Luke and originated with the work of Mark, it's just giving credibility to the origin of the progress. It was never about Mark. It was never about Luke. It was about the message they were receiving, transmitting and transcribing and sending it out. To make it about any individual would have diverted from the purpose of the oral tradition being made written to begin with. But for the sake of multiplication, there would have required a time for them to actually put these works to their proper sources because the message was spreading further than the apostles' individual contacts. Awesome. All right, let's keep going. Texts. Owners of their manuscripts made, again, alterations to the text, for example, corrections, notes, and so on. Medical works were probably more susceptible to this because the genre is very practical. And again, the formula was then applied to differentiate between multiple versions of the same work produced by different manuscript owners. And last but not least, we also see it applied to differentiate between various Greek translations of books found in the Hebrew Bible. Now, uh, I know that Michael thinks there's a valid counterexample to this in 2nd Maccabees, but there actually isn't. 2nd Maccabees includes a letter which... Uh, I don't know what he's talking about. I don't think I use 2nd Maccabees at all in my I video. I was going to ask you where this came from. I have no... You, you know, it may come to like five or seven years ago as I was like brainstorming ideas and I may have said something in really... But like, it's nothing I've put in any published work as far as I'm aware. So I don't know what he's specifically referring to. And if it is, it's probably something I have abandoned just because it was in a brainstorming session or something, but whatever. Which mentions records according to Nehemiah. 
This is sometimes taken to be a reference to the biblical book of Nehemiah, but the letter is about Judas Maccabeus founding a library after the sacking of the Jerusalem temple by Antiochus Epiphanes. And it's clear from context that the records that are being referred to are books in the library that Nehemiah curated, not the biblical book of Nehemiah. The reason why all four Gospels have titles with this specific formula is because at some point in the mid-2nd century, an editor probably in row, collected the four Gospels and prepared them to be published together. And because the editor was aware that the four Gospels are very similar in terms of content, and in the case of the synaptics, they might, you know, as well be regarded as three textual recensions of one literary work, he uniformly applied this formula to all four of them. The attribution to the four authors then became accepted in Rome. It spread from Rome through personal and literary contacts and through manuscript copying, and all extant references to the four authors, both in surviving manuscripts and in other literary works, result from this editorial decision. And just to be clear, that doesn't mean that the editor didn't honestly believe that the four names he chose were names of the actual authors. Okay, let's just stop there because this is a philosophical nightmare yeah. riddled with problems. Uh, Than I'm going to come to you in a minute because, but yeah, I just got to say, like, um, I just want to say real quick, and then I get, before I collect all my thoughts, it's like, for starters, we have to posit some unknown editor in Rome that somehow had such a grip on the Christians it spread out. He could make up this tradition that doesn't even make sense because we already have Justin Martyr in that same period saying these are the memoirs of Peter, not the memoirs of Mark. He's going to make up this tradition. He's going to spread it out. We this, There's no evidence for this. We're accused of all the times of believing things without evidence, but there's no evidence for this whatsoever that this is what happened. Uh, but we, we have to believe this over the unanimous attestation that it does go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So we have all this evidence for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's got to be thrown out because they can posit some unknown editor who we have no evidence for who could have just made this up. And then with his iron grip on all the Christians spread out across the world, he was able to convince them all with his magic wand or something. This is just, this is a double standard. There, there's it, no it evidence is, for this position. Uh, go go it, ahead, Eric. Just, I gotta, he didn't it, use it, a it, wand. It, it's he the it's good. well I mean look look at the pen right there on the AI art it's obviously yeah it's like a <laughs> wand like you said Dan like no I agree this is a bedtime story this is a just so story this is this is the textbook definition of a just so story I just like I made something up that's completely ad hoc and this this explains away the data you know see you later Christians check me I mean I don't think Camille's like necessarily coming down on it as sarcastically as I'm making it here but like. I mean, come on. Like, I, I totally agree with you. This is a just so story. It doesn't really explain the witness of other people. Like you mentioned, Justin, it doesn't explain the witness of Clement of Alexandria, who he's later going to say somehow magically got this from Irenaeus, even though he, he said that he got it from an, an, uh, an ancient or a primitive. And he's I got different and he's got different traditions than Irenaeus. He says the gospels, the genealogies yeah. come first. So he's got different right. traditions in it, but they're both agreeing on who the authorship is. Well, I think that would be the point is how in the world could one single editor universally dupe every church in the world that's at that time? You're, you're telling me that one editor, let's just say he's in Rome, some editor in Rome, because let's just use Marcion because he tried to do stuff. You're telling me that he was able to dupe the churches in North Africa. He was able to dupe the churches in Alexandria. He was able to dupe the churches in Jerusalem and Antioch and dupe all the Eastern churches to come to the same conclusion, to accept those same four authors without any schism, without any split, not a chance. The churches, they argued about a lot of things of practice. And your example, even on what way we should view the gospels based on uh, order and perspective. I mean, I have sitting on my desk over here, a full facsimile of Codex W that I helped when working with the Smithsonian years ago, they, they sent me, uh, the, the facsimile that I have right here. If you look at the order of the gospels in there, it's Matthew, John, Luke, and Mark. Um, and that's a, a fourth to fifth century manuscript because they placed the same idea that Tertullian and others did on the order of gospels but they have the same four gospel writers that we're talking about too. So then the question then becomes, who are these editors? Well, the, it's not, it's not a question of this editor or did they exist? They were transcribers of these texts 
And what we start seeing is a heightened amount of manuscripts that do have the inscriptions. One, because we actually have manuscripts that survived more closer to that time than before. Two, because again, the churches need clarity as to the origin of these texts. And it would have been, if anybody started putting inscriptions for clarity on it, it would be the churches who are starting new churches and ordaining new bishops and new leaders in those churches to read these texts publicly and give the credible origins of each one. And it's more for the purpose of clarity than just let's figure out some names to slap on here and we'll go with it and everybody will believe it and everybody will accept it and that'll be the new thing. No church would have accepted these kind of transmissions. No church would have accepted this kind of way of getting these texts out where one editor can dupe the entire world of churches. It would have never happened. Go ahead, Than. Uh, everybody said everything I wanted to say. <laughs> so okay, yeah. I, yeah, I guess I just want to reiterate. I get, uh, we are, we are accused all the time that we believe in the traditional authorship. There's not enough evidence to confirm that. Well, I want evidence that this tradition actually started in Rome from some unknown editor that somehow got a grip on this and just spread it all out. There, there's no evidence for this. So if if he's allowed to posit that from no evidence, I don't see why I can't hold to gospel authorship, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, when there's abundant evidence for this, your unanimous attestation to this. So again, this is just a double standard here. If you want to say that there's not enough evidence for our position, you can't be positing positions, which there is no evidence for. So, all right, with that, I'm going to move ahead to the next time marker I have, which is at the 26 minute mark. Uh, and so let's do a couple more things here before I think Stephen and Eric need to check out. But let's take a look here. Look to the dedicatee. Okay, but let me tell you an anecdote from Plutarch to make a point. When Julius Caesar was becoming increasingly unpopular, people in Rome started thinking. Real quick, he's responding to the point I made in my video about, you know, Luke would not send some sort of anonymous work to Theophilus. He's going to want to know where this came from. So... Obviously, there had to be some sort of name attached to the gospel that Theophilus gets. So this is what Camille's responding to. Thinking that, you know, it would be a good idea for him to retire to a farm in upstate Italy. And they started encouraging Marcus Brutus, believed to be descended from Lucius Brutus, who drove out the, the last tyrannical king of Rome to, you know, do something about Caesar, which he did by murdering him. But because it wasn't exactly possible to incite him to a political assassination openly, scrolls with political slogans started conspicuously showing up in places where Brutus was likely to randomly find them. These scrolls were turbo anonymous. Nobody, apart from their writers, not even their mums, knew who wrote them. No scholar proposes that the Gospels were originally anonymous like that. Of course, there were initially people who knew who the gospel authors were, just like there were people who initially knew who wrote the epistle to the Hebrews. What's your point? Of course, there were people who knew who wrote the Didache or the letter to Diognetus. We don't. That happens all the time. What I'm arguing is that already in mid-2nd century, Christians had no better idea about who wrote the four gospels than we do today. Just like they didn't know who wrote Hebrews. Yeah, and <laughs> you said it perfectly, Stephen. It doesn't even really address my point of when I brought up the fact that Theophilus would have got something, he would have known who the author was. But go ahead, Stephen. What, well, what I mean, what, they didn't know any more than we do today. They knew <laughs> they said, the... These are the churches of the... These, these people are sitting in the churches the apostles started... These people knew, Polycarp knew the apostles, or particularly at least John. When you're talking about Ignatius, you're talking about uh, Polycarp, you're talking about Papias. You're talking about people that knew the apostles and not just knew them, even if you want to argue they didn't. They're in one of their churches that they started and wrote letters to. That's why Polycarp, when writing to the church of Philippi, could say, read the letter that Paul wrote to you and in doing so, you'll increase your faith. Two things. One, he assumes they still have that letter and that letter was written directly to them and that there was spiritual benefit to reading that letter. So when we look at things like that, what, what Polycarp is doing is he's writing to in a church, writing to a church the apostle Paul started and had left a letter with that a hundred years later still had the letter, knew where the letter came from, still read it publicly in church, 
still had spiritual benefit from all that time after. You're telling me that Polycarp in the middle second century, who knew the apostles <laughs> and his church that he's writing to, that su- that received a letter from Paul almost a hundred years before, all of a sudden they don't know what they got. Like, come on, that's not even consistent with the historical layout we have. How in the world did they know they had a letter from Paul? Paul's been dead for 80 to 100 years by the time they're receiving this one. And how did Polycarp assume that they still had that letter in the church and that they could still read that letter and that they're still benefiting from that letter? Because the churches know what they got and who they got it from. And these churches were still around in the second century that the apostles started. And they're not just around, they're moving fast and they're growing bigger than they ever were when the apostles were alive. That's ludicrous to say that they had no more knowledge then than we do today when you actually read the then people and they know exactly what they have and they're even referencing back to it. Go ahead, Sam. Yeah, I, the only thing I just wanted to add on <clears throat> to that is he he brought up how somebody probably at some point knew who wrote the epistle of Hebrews and now we don't today. But the thing that he f- doesn't mention here, this is one of, like, one of the textbook arguments you here when it comes to gospel authorship but it's the geographical sp- spread of the attestation right like you have near unanimous disagreement among the early church on who wrote hebrews but you have mm-hmm. unanimous agreement on who wrote the four gospels among the early church and um, so it seems kind of weird to bring up hebrews as an example of this hypothesis he's putting up when what he's kind of talking about is actually almost helping the traditional authorship argument when you're looking at the data as a whole you're right. He is because you have, we know that when Theophilus got this, he would have known who this came from. It's very unlikely that someone just stuck this on his door here, Theophilus. It's, there's clearly a relationship between the author who we see. You're not going to talk to somebody that's a stranger and say, call him my dearest. Exactly. <laughs> so you have, so clearly Theophilus knows. What do we see a hundred years later? Churches all over the place are saying, yeah, this comes from Luke. Like, so you're telling me, that Theophil, to, this is this is the hypothesis I'm getting from Camille. So, so Theophilus got it from somebody named Joe, for all we know. He somehow forgets, or he dies with that knowledge. Someone then takes the gospel, and then a hundred years later, some guy's like, I'm going to slap the name Luke on this, who has an iron grip on the whole church from Rome somehow, and then he convinces Christians everywhere, yeah, this all came to Luke. But he can't do the same with Hebrews? I mean, you're basically making the point for us here. This shows that when Theophilus got this, he would be like, oh, this came from Luke. And what is the tradition that we see coming down later that's unanimously there? Yeah, this all came from Luke. There's no disagreement there. So this is, again, another example of shooting yourself in the foot. This does and not help us. And it wouldn't be 100 years later by their argument because they don't date these books the way we date them. They date them much, much, much later into the second century. So they would have You're forgotten right. and lost <laughs> access within 50 years, not 100 years. They would have said it was right. some date Luke to 120. I heard... Just McDonald the other day do it to 120. I mean, it's oh, like, Gre- it's like, Gregory's going to do that because he thinks that Luke used Josephus, which is another well. That's well, a there you, very fringe yeah. view. Very. So, and that, I'm be, I'll, so I'll that's 30 years. An upcoming video. Yeah. So that's 30 years. They forgot. <laughs> they didn't even know within 30 years. I mean, so we're the insanity to me here, and I say that respectfully. I don't. I don't look down at these guys as ignorant. It's just please help me help you, like see how. This was this if the if they're 100 AD, let's just say 100 AD, how in the mid second century they've already lost the knowledge of this? That's a little bit far fetched to be that. Cer- I mean, these aren't they, the Didache wasn't very they use the Didache, the Didache wasn't circulated the way these gospels are circulated. The Didache mm-hmm. was very jurisdictional, very lo- uh, locational. These were distributed throughout. I mean, they were already finding Pontanaeus reports finding the gospel of Matthew all the way into India after he had received, believing he was bringing the message of the gospel for the first time ever to those people. He gets there and finds out somebody beat him to it and they already had a copy of Matthew with them. These are stra- these are going everywhere. And how is it that they over there in India had a copy attributed to Matthew already? I mean, there's no way this could have happened. It's not, it's not even humanly possible. It's not reasonable. Then just it to seems- accept that these people know. <laughs> It, it seems a much more convoluted, complex explanation to think that all this authorship was just lost. Someone in the second century had the power to just convince everyone worldwide of these traditional authors. And that's where it comes. The simpler explanation is, is that the reason why everyone agrees is because it goes back to the four traditional authors. That's 
seems like a far simpler explanation than positing some editor in Rome we've got no evidence for who that Theophilus would have just somehow lost the name or he died with the name. It's just, just the explanation to deny traditional authorship, as you see, gets convoluted. We're building assumptions on assumptions that cannot be justified. It's it's insane. All right. I have the next time spot here. Let's play this one out. No, didn't have any title. Yuval mentioned P1, which is a fragment of a codex leaf, most likely from the 3rd century. It has a chapter number above the text of Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, but no title is extant. But this doesn't necessarily mean that no title was present. As far as I know, for example, Bart Ehrman thinks that it had a title above the chapter number in the portion of the manuscript, which is unfortunately not preserved. Much more. Yeah, I wanted to just acknowledge that Camille is being quite charitable there, and I wanted to acknowledge that. And I also think that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think P1 call, comes with a very, very fragmented flyleaf, which also could include the title attributing it to Matthew. But that's topic for another time. Interesting is P66, one of the earliest if not the earliest surviving manuscript with a gospel title. It's been actually suggested that the title, in this case gospel according to John, was added later, and so the manuscript originally didn't have it. When the manuscript evidence is debated, people are quick to point out that we are missing manuscripts with titles before late second century, which is, and I'm sure this is a complete coincidence, also when we start getting literary attestation to the surviving gospel titles. But today, I want to emphasize that for a much longer period of time, we are only looking at the manuscript evidence through an incredibly tiny keyhole. There are only four surviving manuscript fragments with gospel titles and with the most probable date before the year 350. P66, which I've already mentioned before, P75, and P62. And here's a map showing all the locations that these manuscripts came from. As you can see, it's all clustered in the same part of Egypt. Manuscript evidence tells us nothing about how the Gospels were titled, say, in Spain or in <coughs> Armenia. And what's also very unfortunate, but not for me, is that we also happened to have a very early manuscript of Irenaeus' Against Heresies, the first literary work which names the four traditional gospel authors found in Egypt. This is Oxyrhynchus Papyrus 405, dated to about the year 200, so contemporary or even earlier than the only four manuscripts with gospel titles. This one papyrus of Irenaeus' work largely invalidates even this meager evidence from the four Egyptian manuscripts, because we can conclusively show that the only region from which we have early manuscripts with gospel titles is also a region where the first book naming the traditional authors was read and around the same time only all right <laughs> steven's already unmuted go ahead <laughs> so th this is the problem with the manuscript debate because the papyri are more like they're not going to survive in the west that exactly. long because you're in a dr down in alexandria you're going to find more of this kind of thing because it's in a dry sandy environment that would not destroy and deteriorate the papyrus. Now you can't have that in, in Europe, the, the humidity and the, the, the layout of the land is very, very different. So to say that, well, it's only in this location. Well, we don't have a lot of manuscripts outside of those locations because of the climate and because of the environment. So that's why these things had to be copied over and over and over again. Uh, to continue to preserve them. Uh, so just just off the manuscript side of this alone, and, and, and the second thing with that, that's the assumption the origin of the manuscript began there. You know, there, there are multiple um, reasons to believe that some of the manuscripts we have have certain, um, I don't want to get into textual criticism too much here, but when you get into some of these manuscripts and you start finding some of the readings, you find Eastern Byzantine reading traditions in certain places. And then you find Latin, more Latinized or Western readings, a part of things, even in the papyri, which indicate to us that not all papyri are the same from the same families, uh, from the same breakdown of scribes. It could be that once, you know, things were going through Alexandria and transmission and texts were being taken from one location to another location or being sent out from that location, we cannot assume that just because something was there, that's where it originated from and it was isolated in that place. Um, stuff spread pretty quick, especially from Alexandria. Even Arianism alone, 
distributed itself all the way in the east, but it started in Alexandria and became more popular in Byzantium. So just because a manuscript is found there doesn't mean it's isolated to that place or its origin or something of inscription started right there. We don't know where a lot of those manuscripts came from originally. We know why they survived there and not in those other locations, though. And that's because of the climate and the weather and the sand. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Eric, wanna... you thought... Oh, go ahead, Sam. Go ahead, yeah. I, I, I did have a question because I want to make sure I'm understanding him correctly. Is he arguing that we don't have that many manuscripts with the gospel titles of like gospel mark on them. No, he's saying the earliest ones, like the ones that gather Cole mentions in his paper. He only briefly touch, touches on the manuscripts. This is a minor point in gather Cole's paper that I was mainly relying on. Uh, gather Cole focuses more on church fathers. So he's just going to look at the earliest possible manuscripts and say, Oh, lo and behold, they attribute Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. When, when we find a title on them. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So, Eric, did you have something you want to say? You were unmuted there for a second. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I could say something. I'm, I'm interested in hearing your take on this, Michael. But, um, yeah. I mean, in one sense, I kind of get it. Like, a lot of the manuscripts are coming from Egypt for the reason that Stephen stated. It's a dry arid climate where manuscripts are going to be preserved. That's why we we have tons of our, our, our manuscripts from. So one might say that if the manuscripts in other regions had different titles, we would probably expect to see this reflected in the patristic sources. Yeah. When we get to the patristic sources, as Stephen has already talked to you before, we have people like Tertullian saying like, hey, we're not receiving these anonymous gospels. You, you think that Tertullian probably saw some manuscripts of gospels <laughs> or is he just pull, pulling this out of his, his, his rear end? Well, that's what Irenaeus said. So I'm just going to mindlessly parrot it. No, he probably saw manuscripts. There were manuscripts in that particular region that may have been there for a long time he, he probably saw them and so um and he's saying that like no we don't we don't receive anonymous gospels like don't don't play that stuff marcy that's what marcian does we don't do that you know what i'm saying and so mm -hmm. um yeah i i just wanted to point that out it's not like these guys where this patristic data that we're getting this stuff from is, is all coming from well, this particular area and earlier like he's saying like well you know some guy in rome made this up and then and then i guess like the, the it, it just spread to egypt and then it just spread there like i'm, I'm getting kind of the, the theory is getting a little more weird i guess is what i'm trying to say well i mean yeah what i want to say kyle's about exactly is, right it's a yeah it's a it's a nightmare uh what i want to say about this specifically is like okay so we've all these manuscripts in egypt reporting gospel authorship we know Irenaeus was writing in what in modern day france so he's yeah, on Leon. the other side of the empire but they're so it, he's they're agreeing with this this manuscript evidence we see in egypt uh meritorian fragment is agreeing as well uh um, again clement yep. Cle yeah and so tertullian's agreeing he's in north africa clement is agreeing but he has different traditions he thinks that uh he's disagreeing with Irenaeus on the order he says that the gospels with the genealogies came first so we have a different order when it comes to that right there so Despite, so what all Camille is sort of showing is that there's just, again, wide agreement across the whole Roman world that the four gospel authors are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. How this is supposed to be a problem for us is beyond me. This is supporting our case. If he thinks that there were some manuscripts early on that were anonymous or had different authors attributed to them, produce the evidence. What you're basically admitting right now is when it comes to the early evidence, it's going to agree with our original point. Wide unanimous attestation, the authors are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. None, nothing he says here works against that. So I don't even see why he would bring it up. I mean, the only thing that I'm seeing that he's, he's trying to say, well, Irenaeus said this, and we know that there's a fragment of Irenaeus in Egypt. And so therefore Irenaeus like influenced all the attribution of the manuscripts that we have preserved in Egypt or something. And, and maybe I'm misinterpreting him there, but like, again, that just strikes me as, I don't know, weird, complicated. It, it's, a, it's a little, it's a little bit speculative. But again, it's just a showing, again, unanimous agreement that somehow this started in, in, up in Lyons. It spread all the way to Egypt. And all this agreement is just coming out. And no one is coming along going, hey, no, actually, uh, here in North Africa, we got we, we said this came from Peter. And 
this other one came from Andrew. No, we're not getting any of that. We're getting it all. Everyone's in agreement as this stuff spreads around. So yeah, and 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 just to go with what you're saying, I was referencing this facsimile earlier. I was going to show you. Can't see the paintings on it because that was why it was bought in Egypt. That's uh, the first two apostles because this is the four gospels in this facsimile. That's uh, Matthew and John, uh, and then the second painting is Luke and Mark in that order. Um, and what's what's interesting as to what you were saying with Clement of Alexandria there, Michael, was that there are different uh, debates about what happened in the transmission. We see evidence of that, even the order of these giving precedence in this one to the two apostles, Matthew and John, versus the two disciples of the apostles, Luke and Mark, and placing them in the order they did. And it's interesting that they didn't do Mark, Luke. They did Luke, Mark. Uh, which I find ironic in the facsimile of Codex W. But again, why is this manuscript fully intact just about? I mean, we have even the painting parts of it, it's the earliest one with paintings of the gospel writers on it. Uh, why did it survive this whole time? And it starts uh, with Matthew. You can read the cover very, very well on the front of Matthew 1. Why is it that this one survived, but we don't have something like this over in Byzantium or is something mm -hmm. like this in Rome? Well, because this was in the desert area of Egypt and the others weren't. So to say, well, we only have a handful of manuscripts within these amount of years that have the inscriptions. It's like, man, we really don't want to get into how long we have to wait to start getting inscriptions on manuscripts because we have a lot of antiquity that's thousands of years removed from the original writings before we get these kinds of things like we see in the New Testament. We're closer in the New Testament to the original writings and sources of transmission of manuscripts that have survived antiquity than most Greco-Roman literature. So the fact that we even have anything in the second century at all is incredible Yeah, when it comes to the Gospel of Matthew. I think that's being downplayed. Like, well, we only have a handful. That's more than we have with anything else. That's incredible that anything survived that long. Papyri, papyri was meant to survive 100 to 120 years. The, the, the actual material is only meant to last 100 to 120 years if it's handled properly and if it's taken care of. So the fact that we can read in full print stuff that's 1,600 to 1,800 years old and still translate from those manuscripts is incredibly awesome for us to be able to partake. Like, so, so the point that, that's trying to be belittled here. To me, it actually amplifies that we have a very credible source, both in transmission and in patristic. Right. And I get that Camille is saying that they were not originally anonymous. People knew who wrote them. But again, if that was lost and then it was just changed in the second century, then they are artificially out of these titles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you would not get the unanim unanimous attestation. We see that even Camille is highlighting here with the manuscripts in Egypt and manuscripts from Irenaeus, who was writing all the way up in modern-day France, you would not get that unanimous attestation. Uh, it makes It's a much simpler explanation to say the reason we have unanimous attestation is because it went back to those four authors versus the idea they were originally not anonymous, then they, the traditional authors were forgotten, then someone made it up, and he had used his iron grip on the church. The force. It's, it's a convoluted explanation over the much simpler one. So, all right, with that, let's keep going. This is the next uh, timestamp I got. Reliability. Let's start with issues with independence. The four traditional gospel authors not only appear in titles of surviving manuscripts, but they are also spoken of by various ancient Christian authors. But to what extent are these attestations mutually independent? Is it really true that the same identification of the authors pops into existence separately all around the Mediterranean? What you're seeing on your screen right now is a stemma of literary authors who mentioned Mark being a gospel author before the Council of Nicaea. You, you know, the council which famously did not vote about which gospels should be included in the New Testament. That decision was actually made by an unknown editor in mid-2nd century. And I'm showing the stemma of Mark because it's the earliest gospel and so it had the most time to accumulate attestation. As you can see, these authors are connected. They are connected either through literary dependence, for example, the anonymous work Refutation of All Heresies, falsely attributed to Hippolytus, quotes from Against Heresies by Irenaeus, or they are connected through discipleship. For example, Dionysius of Alexandria studied under origin of Alexandria, and so on. To my knowledge, what you're seeing on your screen right now are all the known authors who identify Mark as a gospel writer in anti-Nicene literature. Apart from these, the Markan authorship... Okay, so let's, let me put that thing back up on the screen for you guys. 
and take a look at this here. So he's saying that he's trying to make the argument that they all just sort of, this is the tree they all descend from in terms of that. A um, lot I want to say on this, but Steven, you're on me to go ahead. Yeah, that, that's, that was because I just didn't hit mute. Sorry, but I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and answer that anyway. So um, again, what are, we, what are we dealing with here? What we're saying is all these guys are copying everybody at the end of the day. And Papias started this and everybody just copied Papias, except, except nobody said that. Um, it, again, Irenaeus does refer to Papias. And the time that he does is not even in the same book that he references the four gospels. Um, yeah. You're assuming that Tertullian, who is originally in Rome, who went down to North Africa, that he is stealing from Papias of Heriopolis, who he doesn't even reference. The dude's a lawyer. He's a legal Tr a legally trained lawyer from Rome who went down to North Africa to defend Christianity in that region. He's not going to take Papias's statements and start creating stuff that he got from this guy who got it from Papias. He doesn't do that, nor does Irenaeus. Irenaeus was very aware of who Papias was, but he does not attribute his knowledge of the Gospels from Papias, although that's been assumed upon him. The same list that we have here, too. He also has individuals in here like Clement of Alexandria. Well, if Clement of Alexandria is just getting it from Irenaeus, back to your point, why is the list order different? You see, what they're doing is trying to find commonality of, of, of connection. And, and they're also almost putting these people into a modern age as if they have the ability to correspond the way that we do. I'm not saying they didn't correspond. But when Tertullian is mentioning where he gets information, he was not shy at mentioning names and locations, good or bad people. He did both. The same thing is true of Irenaeus. When he wanted to call somebody out, he called them out explicitly by location and name and associations, and whether for better or for worse. So if he's getting his information from Papias of Heriopolis, then why isn't he mentioning that? He doesn't mention that's where he gets his information. So this is a made, this whole chart is built on the major assumption that everybody is getting their origin from Papias. But let's just say they are. Let's just say they are. If Papias is a hearer of John and Papias knew the living and abiding voices, those that were with Jesus, and we only know distinctly of two gospel names by hand that he uses, Mark and Matthew, we assume he's familiar with the pr prologue of uh, Luke based on things that he says. And we assume that he's familiar with John based on the names of the disciples he lists. But when it comes to, let's just say Matthew and Mark, if Papias is truly the, the head of all of this, and he actually did know John, and he actually did know the, the eyewitnesses, and this information is what he got from them, what's wrong with that? If that's all we like, he if he knew the right people and he knew the apostles themselves or the disciples of the apostles and relayed the information that he had received of these things, what's wrong with that anyway? Isn't that what you want when you're trying to find information? If you don't know the person themselves that actually wrote a text, find the next closest thing to them. I don't agree with this chart. It makes a ton of assumption. You're assuming that these there, he's assuming that these individuals are borrowing off of one guy, which they don't say they are. And you're assuming that that one guy, even if he did have that information, we shouldn't listen to him. Yeah. And I, mean, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, you're also leaving out the fact that Aaron Ace is getting information from Polycarp, who was again, exactly. someone who exactly. learned from John. So you're having agreement there again, when this is this, this chart is just way too simple. The, the, the text that we have now is fragments of things that have been lost just because that's the way the papyrus happens. We lost so much of the time because of it. This is just a, these are just different witnesses to say that this all goes back to Papias. It's just not, again, it's not what the church fathers say. And even if it does, that's a pretty good witness uh, again. And then you also have the manuscript evidence as well. So again, this is not the, the only note I actually put down for this section was this is an example of shooting yourself in the foot. Because again, you're admitting we have pretty good witnesses, Papias or Irenaeus going to Polycarp, who's not on there. But again, this is just a way, way oversimplification. Go ahead, Eric. Well, I mean, Clement is writing around the same time as Irenaeus. Um, he's just assuming that he's yeah. like dependent on him, which I, I don't know. I find that to be kind of weird. Um, Charles Hill, um, he writes, I'll just quote this real quick. 
He says, Eusebius had a copy of one of Clement's book, which has not survived. Uh, his, uh, Stephen might have to help me pronounce this here. Hi, hi, hypotyposis? I don't know. I'm, I, I'm probably butchered that pretty bad. Stasis. Hypostasis, that's right. Or, well, whatever. <laughs> um, anyways, it says, in this book, Clement repeats an earlier tradition which he received about the Gospels, right? And he, he mentions authors. This tradition probably came from his older colleague, uh, Patanias, who in turn attributed it to the primitive elders, right? So primitive elders, Irenaeus, uh, doesn't seem to be like a very good fit. Uh, it said that the Gospels, which contain the genealogies, genealogies of Jesus, that is Matthew and Luke, no other gospel we know contains a genealogy of, genealogy of Jesus, were the first of the four to be written, that Mark was written for those in um, Rome who had heard the apostle preachers preaching and wanted to record it, and that John, last of all, composed a spiritual gospel. Calling John, last of all, clearly sets these four gospels, or sets these four, forgive me, uh, clearly sets these gospels apart from any others which may have been produced by others at a later time. Clearly, these four are in a class by themselves. And just a significant Clement here is repeating um, what he had ultimately received from primitive elders. This means that Clement, who had just written after Irenaeus, did not derive this view of the uniqueness of these four from Irenaeus or anyone of this his generation. And so it just it feels like to me, he's just trying to like really cram jam all of this into dependent. <laughs> Well, and like, I just, I have to squeeze all of this into going through one guy, but it's too, simpl too simplistic. There's not enough evidence that's really supporting it. There's a lot of assumptions that seem to me to be just like baked into to this and without a whole lot of evidence backing it up. Um, and so, yeah, um, I, I, I don't know. I think Hill is on the money. And with that, um, I will probably have to log out because I had a couple hours and my internet for a while, you guys were like completely off my screen, and I was just uh, <laughs> like, uh, I don't know, I, I got extra Pentecostal, Michael. All just that hoping for the best. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, thanks for coming, Eric. I appreciate your insight. Uh, and uh, Than, Stephen, you guys are welcome to stay. I'm going to move ahead to the next clip, though. All right, see you guys. See yeah, you thanks right. for coming. Appreciate it. All right, so the next one I have is 3545 here is the next part I want to address because things start getting a little interesting here. Just to reiterate, Irenaeus and Clement of Alexandria contradict each other when it comes to the order in which the four canonical gospels were written. And this is not the only quote-unquote variation between them. Irenaeus also says that the gospel of Mark was written only after Peter died. And I think that Irenaeus believed that because, and I agree with him on this, this is the natural reading of what Papias says about Mark's literary activity, i.e. that Mark wrote down whatsoever he remembered from the teachings of Peter. But Clement actually claims that Mark wrote the gospel when Peter was still alive and that Peter knew about it. Clement reportedly wrote about this in his work called Hypotyposes, which I've seen translated as outlines. But that work is lost. We only have fragments, mostly in Eusebius. And Eusebius was nice enough to preserve not only what Clement wrote, but also who his sources were. Uh, Eusebius says, and I quote, Clement gives the tradition of the earliest presbyters as to the order of the Gospels. Unfortunately, we don't know who these presbyters are supposed to be. Several candidates have been suggested, but this is where the trail goes cold. Clement, citing a prior source, paradoxically makes the problem worse because it pushes it further back in time. Normally, you'd think that getting contradictory answers to the same question from contemporary authors should lower your confidence that they have reliable information, but not according to Michael, apparently. I should... All right. This, again, another example. Of... <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll get to you in a minute here, Stephen, but this, this, this apparently is supposed to lower our confidence in the gospel authorship. This was a very point I brought up. This was a very point, as I, point I, I brought up to argue that we can be more confident in the traditional authorship. Why? Because they have different sources. He just made the case they're all getting this information from Papias. But now he's arguing they all contradict each other. Right. Okay. That would suggest they're getting their traditions from other people than just one guy, who, Papias, who apparently made this all up. Uh, so which is it? Did they just Are they just all copying Papias or are they contradicting each other because they're getting information from other sources? You can't have it both ways. And the reason why I brought this up in my original video was because this helps raise the probability the, the gospel authorship, the traditional authorship, is accurate. Why? Because if you've got a bunch of different witnesses and they disagree on where gospels were written or when they were written, 
or who was entirely, you know, like w- what were they doing at that time? But they still agree that it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's going to raise the probability. If I'm interviewing a bunch of eyewitnesses to a crime, and one guy says he wore a red hat, one guy says he wore a blue hat, but they both agree he was Caucasian, I may not know the hat, but I know he was Caucasian because they're going to have, there's a point of agreement there with multiple attestation. So again, this is another example of shooting yourself in the foot. If they, if these later church fathers disagree about when they were written, but they still agree that it goes back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's going to make it more probable. Yeah. So that was the question. Are they contradicting or copying? Because, you know, a minute ago, they're all copying each other. And if you're going to copy each other and you're all supposed to have the same narrative and same speaking lines, you should have the same everything. The fact is they have variations and traditions of how it happened, not who wrote them. And so this goes back and I've got the quotes here. Irenaeus said that wherefore also Mark, the interpreter and follower of Peter, he's not denying whether or not Peter is still alive or not. He acknowledges he knew Peter and whether or not his tradition was that Mark published it after Peter died or right before whatever he doesn't say, it doesn't even get into any of that. It's just that he was a follower of Peter and he interpreted what he said. Here's where they are consistent. So Clement does say Mark wrote Peter's teaching while Peter was alive. Mm -hmm. Peter didn't urge this or forbid it. It does not say that he published it says he wrote it. So it, when and where that part gets a little bit um, debated, but they're not even contradicting each other that much here either. They're just focusing on different aspects of it. Now, remember, Clement of Alexandria is in John Mark's church. So we got to talk about that perspective of, all right, where is Clement getting his information about the gospel Mark? Well, we're being told it's from Papias. Well, that's not true. He said he got it from the Presbyters. Now, we don't have the name of these Presbyters as the video just showed us, but let's talk about how that language would have been used. The Presbyters would have been individuals that were assigned into the church leaders. Well, where is he? He's in Alexandria. Oh, so these are leaders in the church of Alexandria, probably bishops, leaders and elders within the church. How did they get the information? Succession, because they're in the succession line to who? Oh, it just so happens to be John Mark who started their church. And so John Mark starts the church of Alexandria. He leads his successors there and they continue on his traditions and texts. And Clement of Alexandria, just a few years after John Mark is now telling us about how the gospel Mark was published and in what way it was done. Peter didn't necessarily want to do it, but he wasn't opposed to John Mark doing it. And where would he have gotten that information? That does not correspond with Papias' story of how Mark began. He does say Mark was an interpreter of Peter. He does not say anything about Peter's perspective of him doing that. Why Mm -hmm. is it and where would that extra information have come from? It would have come from the presbyters that he knew. Who were they? Probably the bishops in the Church of Alexandria who were in succession to John Mark, who would have carried John Mark's tradition and passed it down to their next successors. That's the difference here. So no, they're not borrowing from the same source. And I don't even think they're contradictory. I think they're focusing on different aspects of its development. But the who is the same in all of it. Finn, did you want to add anything? I saw you were unmuted there. Yeah, no, I, Stephen said everything I wanted to say. Man, I, you know what? (laughs) I'm honestly, look, look, I'm fine with it because Stephen, you're, you're, this is your wheelhouse. So I'm fine just chiming in here and there after. It's all right. I'll be gone in 15 minutes. It'll be all you, Finn. (laughs) All right. All right, let's move ahead to the next one because I think that was pretty much addressed. Uh, let's go here. Data. We see unanimous consent that the four gospel authors are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. No one ever claims another author for the four canonical gospels. And no one ever suggests the gospels were understood as anonymous. See, it's not actually true that the attestation is unanimous. In the case of the Gospel of John, we see at least four different candidate authors. The question of its authorship is inseparably tied to the question of the identity of the beloved disciple. You know, the disciple who testifies to these things and has written them. Most Christians today seem to accept that the author is John, son of Zebedee. This identification is first made in mid-2nd century in the apocryphal acts of John. Maybe. And I say maybe because the identification is only made in a speech given by John reserved in one late medieval manuscript. 
where it appears among various other writings. And it's actually not clear whether it's an original part of the Acts of John, and it's not even clear where it's supposed to fit in the Acts. Some modern scholars put it towards the beginning, others towards the end. To my knowledge, an explicit identification of the beloved disciple with John son of Zebedee is first made in Catholic literature by Dionysius of Alexandria in mid-3rd century, but I could be wrong on that. About two generations earlier, Polycrates of Ephesus wrote that the beloved disciple was a person named John who wore pathalon, a part of the priestly attire, meaning that he was a temple priest. And obviously, a priest of the Jerusalem temple and a Galilean fisherman are two different people. This is not a difference in minor details or a unique priestly tradition. These are two entirely separate figures. And Okay. So with that, I don't think Camille's aware that I have been vocal. I agree with Richard Bauckham on this, that the author of the Gospel of John was not John, son of Zebedee, but John the Elder, who Papias identifies. Uh, so, but again, this is irrelevant to the main point or gather Cole's point. Who was the author of the gospel of John? It was John, a disciple of Jesus, whether that was John, son of Zebedee or John, the elder. I don't think that's a problem for Christians or people who hold the traditional authorship because we can say, yeah, it was John, a disciple. There were multiple Johns. There were multiple disciples of Jesus. Some of them probably shared the same name. We know that some of them shared the same name. It's not going to bother me if it's going to be John the Elder or John the Disciple, specifically the son of Zebedee. It was John, a disciple of Jesus, an eyewitness of Jesus, someone who learned directly from Jesus. That's the that's the whole point of that. Whether it was, and, and again, I, I when I read Bachman, I was actually kind of convinced of his arguments and I lean that direction anyway. So I don't see why this is a big issue for me. It's still John a disciple of Jesus, someone who saw and talked with Jesus. Go ahead, Sam. Yeah, yeah, no, I like for me personally, I'm still trying to figure out which John it is. I'm that's kind of like laying on my cards on the table. That's where I'm at. But what you just said, Mike, is on point. It's on an evidential val on like on an evidential scale of like the value of the gospel of John. Either way, it's a disciple, right? And what somebody that we can trace back that is close to the times and places of the life and ministry of Jesus. That's why we care about the gospel authorship. Um, the next thing I just really wanted to point out is he's kind of just, it sounds like he's, I feel, I feel like he's making like a mountain out of a molehill here. Cause yeah. you're talking about how we are talking about how it's unanimous uh, about the, the agreement on gospel authorship. And then he brings up this one disagreement as if that kind of takes the, takes everything away when it's like well no we still have all of this unanimous disagreement and it's not even that big of a disagreement it seems like to me because both of these alleged johns are disciples so it just doesn't seem like that big of a point to me it, yeah, and my, my view is shaking it up a little bit because i think that both johns were in the johannan community and both johns would have been involved in the gospel of john uh, I do think there were two Johns, and I think that the whole entire Johannine writing, save the book of Revelation, was written from the Johannine community perspective, which would have involved two Johns. I think John, the son of Zebedee, is the main author of it. Now, we may, so Bachman and, and, and perhaps us here, we would differ probably a little bit on this, except for the fact that I think that John, the son of Zebedee, is the main narrator of this gospel. And on the other hand, I think that the other John was actually involved in this gospel. And I think he's also the penman of second and third John, uh, distinct from the penman in first John. But the language is very similar because it's the same Johannine community with the same scribes and the same group. But the main interest, the person of interest, I think are different. And Jerome even suggests something like that. The second, third John were perhaps written by the John the Elder, because he talks about there's two monuments, there's two graves dedicated to two Johns in Ephesus. Um, so was there probably two Johns? It seems like Papias is saying there was. It's not definitive, but yet Jerome kind of studied this out. Eusebius kind of studies it out, and they find out oh, there are two. There are two tombs uh, designated to John, and so it's possible that there were. And John was a common name just like anything else. It wouldn't shock me out of all the people that followed Jesus how many Simons, how many Judases? I mean, he had 
three and four of a lot of people. How many Marys follow Jesus? And then we see other Johns in there. We see the John, uh, John the Baptist, John the son of Zebedee. What shocked me if there's another John that followed Jesus? So I do think that uh, even with, of course, I hold John's a group gospel. I don't think it's an individual gospel. So it doesn't change my view even, even though that we differ on this panel just a little bit about which John it was. It still doesn't change my view because it was a group gospel. And I believe both Johns were in that Johannan community. Yeah, and again, this doesn't threaten the main point, which is that the church but tradition it did bait is and that... switch. But it did bait and switch the point because the bait and switch was it's not universally attested. But what about Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Because there's no examples of what we're talking about on any of those three. So those yeah, are universally exactly. attested. So this to me is a bait and switch. The fourth one is John. You and I are saying, okay, there's some dispute about which John but not which, and by the way, uh, let me just state on this, the, um, he showed priestly garments. The idea of that and the way it's been translated in other literature does not necessarily mean Hebrew priestly garments. Right. It does I do not mean, that, yeah. it, 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 it could also be a special sash that was worn by the Greeks. So hmm. that was a little, again, too black and white. There's room for debate on so much of what was said, but I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm just saying, I think we, even though we disagree here, even though, to me, it was kind of a, a bait and switch. Like, well, Michael said they're universally no disputes there. That's still the case that these are eyewitness based. And you just took all the evidence from Matthew, Mark and Luke, which he spent most of the video focusing on. Now, all of a sudden it's John. That's the problem, but it's not the problem. If you understand there's two different Johns that were with Jesus. Right. And I mean, the main point is the, the external attestation says the four gospel authors were Matthew, a disciple of Jesus, Mark, the interpreter of Peter, Luke, the traveling companion of Paul, and John, the disciple of Jesus. Whether yeah. that was John, the son of Zebedee or John, the elder at the end of the day, I'm not, it's not a hill I'm going to die on. No, no, it's still, it's still, you're still going to have that unanimous attestation. So as Than said, he's making a mountain out of a molehill. All right, here's the next clip. And then Steve, if you need to take off after this, go for it. To wait, there's more. The anti-Marcionite prologue to the Gospel of John claims that the fourth gospel was dictated to papers by a person named John, who excommunicated Marcion. But Marcion was active over a century after Jesus' death, and so this John could not have been a disciple of Jesus. And so we have a third contradictory identification. Unless of course... All right, Stephen, I know you probably want to comment on this, the anti-Marcion -Mar prologue, so whenever you're ready, go for it. Yeah, I was trying to pull it back up, actually. Um, if I can find it, what do you think his main point in bringing that up was? I, I'm a little bit confused because so I'll, I'll just read. I got it pulled up now. The gospel of John was revealed and given to the churches by John while still in the body, just as Papias of Hariopolis, the close disciple of John related in the Exoterics. That is in the last five books. Indeed, he wrote down the gospel while John was dictating carefully. Now what he's, what the anti marcionite prologue is claiming is that Papias was the amanuensis to John for the Gospel of John. Now, Bacham flirts with that a little bit because the order of disciples and naming of them that is given in Papias's uh, statement is the exact order that they appear in the Gospel of John. So he certainly would have been familiar with it. Now, help me guys understand our friend's argument here because... I'm I, I I may be failing again to see what is the pushback that's supposed to draw me and go, okay, there's some unreliable source here. We need to work on finding better data. Like I'm I'm confused again by this statement and how it's supposed to combat what were you making an argument somewhere that he's responding to that I'm not familiar with? Well, he's trying with? to say that this is a different John than John the son of Zebedee or John the Elder. However, Camille does go on to note that the authors of the prologue may have been confused about the timing of everything, uh, which, you know, again, supports my point. We can be less confident about when the Gospels were written from external attestation, but we can still be confident that they're still attributing them to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Two disciples, two people that follow the disciples. So I don't see this as being, bringing up the anti-Marcian prologue doesn't threaten the case. What it points out is we can just be less confident about when these were written, who was present with the main authority figures behind each gospel. Oh, yeah. It I mean, doesn't we, actually, you know, make a problem for us. 
Yeah, we, we have attestation that the Gospel of John was written after he got off the island of Patmos, and that revelation was written before John. I mean, we have yeah. statements about when it was done, and all of them pretty much say he was a very old man when it was done. Now, the Antimarsonite prologue, to be clear, does not explicitly say son of Zebedee John. No. It just says the disciple. So he was a disciple of John. It doesn't say which one. And it says that he did it while he was still in the body, while he was still alive, and that he was a close disciple of John. Now, we know Papias admitted that he was a disciple of uh, two of the disciples of Jesus, being John the Elder and Aristion. So it is possible that the Antimarsonite prologue is referring to this John the Elder. But notice what he says. The gospel of John was revealed and given to the churches by John while in the body. That goes back to what I was saying. So what we do learn from the Antimarsonite prologue is this. The apostles gave writings to their churches. <laughs> and the churches had the history, the writing, and the and really the deposit to protect those texts and to continually transmit them in their tradition. So the churches of John received this letter. So if we're going to find out where the authority should be, all right, how do we know if John wrote this? We go to his churches and we seek the archives. Well, Irenaeus was a part of John's churches. Though he was sent to Lyon, he was sent from the east. He was sent by Polycarp in Smyrna, who was trained by John. So Irenaeus's tradition is going to come from about John from John's churches and John's bishops and successors, he being one of those himself. So actually, the Antimarsonite prologue only validates our argument of transmission and chain of custody, but it doesn't dismiss our position on John because it explicitly says that Papias was the scribe for John putting together this gospel. And by the way, that's why I believe that Papias was a part of the Johannan community because he would have been a part of the Heriopolis group. He would have been appointed there by John himself. It's very likely he would have been in the room when this was going on. So I actually hold the position that perhaps Papias was one of the scribes working on the Gospel of John within the Johannan community, putting it together. Yeah, and I'm definitely in favor of that view as well. But again, this doesn't create a problem. It's still John, which it says, the disciple of Jesus, which is correct. all Gather Cole, Mike Lacona, Martin Hangel have argued in the past, or Brent Petrie, you name it. They're not saying that we can therefore say that we can know specifically which John it was who was a disciple of Jesus. They're just arguing that it demonstrates it was John, a disciple of Jesus at the end of the day. All right, let's yep. move ahead to the next clip here. I've got to head out, guys. Well, geez, it was fun. You got to head out? Yeah. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming. Yeah, I was able to stay yeah, a little bit longer than I thought. Awesome. All right, Good we'll work, see you gentlemen. later. See you. Epiphanius and Phalastrius claimed that they were Christians called the Alogoi, named after the rejection of the Logos theology. They maintain. So th this is him. Uh, this is just to everyone update. Camille is arguing uh, for another alleged author of the Gospel of John. So this is a very late one, though, which is going to be a very relevant point here. Christians called the Alogoi, named after the rejection of the Logos theology. They maintained that the Gospel of John and the Revelation of John were written by a heretic named Serinthus. Serinthus lived in late 1st and early 2nd century and seems to be one of the earliest known interpreters of the Gospel of John. Now, there's some debate about whether the Alogoi actually existed. You know, these kinds of neat divisions of heretics into distinct sects is in many cases just a construct created by the heresiologists. Okay, so the problem with the Serensis uh, attribution here is because Again, this is going outside of Gather Cole's window frame. He's just looking at basically the, the first few centuries of attestation. I mean, if you're going to include, you know, Epiphanius talking about these much later heretics, you might as well include Augustine mentioning Faustus, who says the Gospels, who doubts the entire traditional authorship much later to begin with. But Gather Cole was focusing on the earliest attestation. And plus, like, as even um, Camille admits, this is an unre unreliable idea. We're not even sure if this group even existed. Uh, this is a very late tradition. I believe it's dating to like the fourth century, not in the early centuries before like the Christians got political power within the empire. This is much early. This is something that's just unreliable and it's late. So that's why Gallicol left this out entirely. It's not part of the earliest attestation, which is unanimous. So again, irrelevant to the main point that Gallicol, Lacona, 
Martin Hangel all bring up? Um, for people that want to know a little bit more on the Allogai group objection to the Gospel of John, um, I have a stream that I did with somebody named Bram Rawlings. Uh, it's titled Who Wrote the Gospels? And we cover that objection pretty in depth at around like yeah. the one hour and 50 minute mark. So go check that out because I don't remember what I what we all said there. <laughs> if you, the Stan, if you give me a link, I'll put it in the video description below when we're done. Okay. So just give me a link and I will drop it in there so people can just easily click on it after. But yeah, I mean, again, th this is a very, very late att attribution. It's not something that Gather Cole included in his paper because – it's not a. It's not coming directly from the heretics itself. It's coming from yeah. you know writers like Epiphanius, who we know made a lot of errors when he was writing about these alleged heretical groups and these alleged pagan beliefs and you name it. So, and it also comes to the, from the fourth century. So this is why it's not included or is, is accepted as a reliable tradition that there really was this early group in the second or first century attributing the Gospel of John to someone else. Uh, so again, not even sure why he brought this up. All right, so let's move ahead to 47. Uh, 35 is the next time marker I have here. And um, as we continue through this stream, the time markers are going to get a little more spread out because, again, Camille goes down a lot of rabbit holes. I don't have time to address literally everything. I'm just trying to hit the main points. When we look at how the various ancient Greek, Latin, Syriac, and Coptic texts treat the various occurrences of the name Mark in the Book of Acts, the Pseudopoline letters, and First Peter, we see anything between one and three separate figures. For example, a list of apostles and disciples, falsely attributed to Hippolytus, but this time Hippolytus of Thebes, differentiates between Mark the Gospel writer, Mark the cousin of Barnabas, and John Mark. But for example, when Jerome talks about a person named Mark, mentioned in the epistle to Philemon, he says, and I quote, whom I think is the author of the gospel. What do you mean you think? And these are just some of the major figures. When it comes to more obscure apostles, disciples, or early bishops, who is who is, again, all over the place in writings of ancient Christian authors and various contradictory lists. The situation is maybe even worse when it comes to identification of women. For okay, so... Now he's trying to appeal that, well, there were many Marks, there were many Johns. Yeah. How do we know who it was? Again, it's, it, again, the argument we're making is the external attestation says it was Mark, the interpreter, Peter, whether it was John Mark or some other Mark. The, art, the external attestation says it was John, the disciple of Jesus. Again, if it was John, the son of Zebedee or John, the elder, again, not a hill worth dying on. That That's irrelevant to the main point. Yeah. This doesn't threaten the main argument of traditional authorship. Yeah. And the main point, again, that I just really wanted to put across here is that regardless of which mark it is, this doesn't really call into question whether or not he's an interpreter or Peter. And that's the the data that we have in the Gospel of Mark relates, again, back down to people that were close in time to the to the times in ministry and works of Jesus. So I'm just it, it's more mountains out of molehills for me. It, it, you're right. It's mountains out of molehills. And again, this not, the problem with a lot of his arguments is they've not threatened traditional authorship. And to take his view that they were originally known and then the original authors were somehow lost and then someone made it up in the second century, forced it on them, and then it somehow just took hold like wildfire is a much more convoluted explanation than it just goes back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Like It's a much more convoluted argument. Example, conservative Christian scholar Richard Bockham, whom Michael mentions, argues that the author of the gospel is not John, son of Zebedee, but a different disciple of Jesus, also named John, and that many early Christian writers who identify the gospel author as John actually mean this different John. For example, and contrary to popular belief, Irenaeus doesn't identify the gospel author with John, son of Zebedee. He calls him an apostle, but that doesn't narrow it down. Because and I, I just wanted to play that point because, again, I don't think Camille knows my position well. Uh, nowhere did I make the case that it was necessarily John the Son of Zebedee in my video. I mean, I was on, I believe, your channel last year when we were responding to Captain Dadpole, and I said, yeah, I believe it's John the Elder. So it's like, I again, I don't I don't see this. Yeah. This is another example of mountains out of molehills here. All right, I'm going to move ahead to 55. Because, uh, again, I want to, we're going to, getting closer to the end, and I just want to sort of get there. So 5504. Yeah. And we will be wrapping up soon because we've addressed a lot of the main points. Can't get to every single one of the rabbit trails. Just going to try it as much as we can. Can you show me any 
work from antiquity that was attributed to so many different authors so soon, and yet scholars are still confident that we know who wrote it? I don't know any. Michael implies that scholars who don't subscribe to the traditional gospel authorship engage in some sort of double standard because other works from antiquity that are considered authentic have their authorship attested less well. As Michael Kona says, the best source attesting Plutarch's authorship is the Lampreas catalog, written more than a century and perhaps more than two centuries after Plutarch's death. Okay, so real quick. Uh, Dan, did you want to say anything on this before I go? Because I want to say my whole point is the evidence. Yeah, sometimes <laughs> scholars can have a double standard. Yeah. I did a whole video titled Are Christian Scholars Biased? You remember that video? Yes, I do. <laughs> and I, I basically, research shows there's something called Christianophobia in academia. This is not coming from me. This is coming from actual studies that have been done that there is an anti-Christian bias sometimes in academia that does lead to this type of double standard. And, you know, people like you and I are sitting here going, scratching our head going, we have so much attestation for the gospel authorship. Why are people doubting this? And yet they're going to just say, yeah, oh, those are the lives of Plutarch right there. Those are the lives of Plutarch. Everyone yeah. knows. It, it, it can very well be a double standard. But look, at the end of the day, I'm just trying to – the video he's responding to, I was just trying my hardest to focus on the actual evidence of traditional authorship. Trying to then poison the well here by saying that, oh, whoa, is he really going to say this about scholars? Well, if the yeah, shoe exactly. fits, if the shoe fits, I don't know what to tell you. And we'll get to something later, but I do think there, there's a good example of some bias that does come up. Like when they accuse Matthew of claiming Jesus rode two donkeys into Jerusalem. I'm sorry. Yeah. If you think Matthew actually wrote that, I do not think you're reading the gospel fairly. No, no, you're not. And look, look. I think you hit the nail on the head with the whole poisoning of the well thing, because th this happens a lot with, it, at least in my experience, it happens a lot with counter apologetics a lot. People just be like, oh, you just think all the scholars are wrong or you just whatever. And it's like, yeah, I do. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I'm very outspoken about how I think there's huge epistemological issues happening in oh, biblical yeah, scholarship. Sure. It, it's it, it's. Yeah, I'm happy saying that, and I'll stand on that flag, and I will show the epistemological issues. Like, I, what's the issue? <laughs> Absolutely, and yeah, that's something I completely agree with here. I mean, yeah, there there definitely is some sort of weird standard going when it comes to the Gospels that they're always assumed guilty until proven innocent. But we right. don't do that with Tacitus. We don't do that with Plutarch. I'm not saying that means you have to accept everything in the Gospels, but. It doesn't seem like the principle of charity is applied, which is, I think, is a huge problem in, in scholarship. And, yeah. you know, here's something else. Another analogy I'll make is that, look, I have been doing a lot of videos on the documentary hypothesis in the for the old for the Pentateuch. When you start going through the scholarship on that, you're, you're kind of scratching your head going like there's a lot of just like assuming the documentary hypothesis, not actually arguing for it. And the evidence for it is really few and far in between. A lot of the. Uh, connections that gen the authors of Genesis are making in this unified narrative are just flat out ignored. A lot of the counter arguments against the documentary hypothesis are ignored. For example, uh, uh, Joshua Berman in his book, Inconsistencies in the Torah, uh, wrote about how long ago Gordon Wenham critiqued the documentary hypothesis uh, for the flood account. And he got like one reply and most of his critique was just entirely ignored. And he's saying, look, there's just a – Berman's basically saying there's a lot of just presupposing the documentary hypothesis is true and ignoring criticisms and moving on. That's not coming from me. That's coming from scholars like, again, Joshua Berman, um, the authors of the book uh, Exploring the Composition of the Pentateuch, George Fisher, for example, in there. So you definitely do get bias in scholarship. There's no doubt about that. I think the documentary hypothesis is just sort of like assumed half the time, even though the evidence for it is riddled with problems. The whole hypothesis is just – when you start diving in, it just collapses entirely. And I've done replies to Joel Baden for people in the comment section. And I'm going to be doing another reply to him on the different naming of Israel uh, coming out, I think, probably not till March or something. But yeah, so there's a lot there. But yeah, let's keep going. Additionally, it is falsely attributed to Plutarch's son. Still, no one questions Plutarch in authorship. I argue that the actual situation with gospel authorship is in fact precisely the opposite of what Michael says. Authorial attribution of extra-biblical works is routinely 
rejected because of much less severe issues than what we see with the Gospel of John. For example, scholars reject that Plutar wrote the Lives of the Ten Orators, even though it is included in the Lambrias catalog, which Lacona claims is the best source for Plutarchan authorship. And why do these scholars reject it? Well, it's based on exactly the same methods, which lead critical scholars to reject, for example, the authorship of the pseudal Pauline epistles. And just to be clear, I'm not arguing that the Gospel of John was actually written by Apostle Sarinthus, although he would, of course, be a much more plausible author than a Galilean fisherman. Rather, this highlights that 2nd century and later Christian writers didn't have a very clear idea where these texts came from, and that any particular identification of the author is just a theory, a Bible theory. So, <laughs> um, Stephen addressed this earlier when he said that's absolutely insane. The 2nd century church fathers had plenty of good evidence, far more than we had to accept traditional authorship. Especially when you look at the chain of Irenaeus going through Polycarp, who was taught by John, that kind of thing. Uh, but his analogy with the, Lam the Lampers catalog, mentioning one life may not be attributed to Plutarch, is not really a good analogy to this argument. Because, sure, we can accept that maybe one of the lives put in there, or maybe a couple, weren't actually written by him. I would disagree with that. I think there's probably some issues with regards to scribe on there, but I could be wrong. Not a hill worth dying on. The point Lycona was making is that no one's going to doubt that the majority of the lives that we have are going to go to Plutarch, not his son, even though the Lampras catalog says it was written by his son. Just because maybe like one or a couple might be forged that have been included, that's not going to change the overall argument. People are still going to recognize this corpus goes back to Plutarch. You could make the same case with Paul's letters. People can say like, Oh, yeah, you know, a lot of people doubt first and second, Timothy and Titus, but they still recognize that the corpus of Paul letters goes back to the historical Paul. No one doubts that. Uh, same with uh, the lives of Plutarch. So the reason I brought that up in my original video was basically like, look, when we have all this external attestation, we don't doubt it, for example, with Plutarch's lives, even though maybe one life, one of the, the life you mentioned there may not may have been something that was forge read later, it's not going to cause us to doubt that all the lives are not going back to the actual historical Plutarch. Likewise, we're not going to do this with the Gospels. We're not going to just, when we have unanimous attestation here, why would we doubt that either? Yeah, and I, I just, he, if I'm understanding him correctly, um, he's trying to just call into question like the sources of the early church, right? And I just wanted to read Eusebius's Historia Ecclesiastica, like he says this about Papi, like quote talking about Papias, and he says, um, and whenever and whenever anyone came down who had been a follower of the elders, I asked about their words, what Andrew or Peter had said, or Philip or Thomas or James or John or Matthew or any of the Lord's disciples, and what Aristion and the Presbyter John, disciples of the Lord, and this is the part that's really important, were still saying. In other words, like PVS had direct acquaintance with these sayings at the time. So I'm just not entirely sure how we can just say these are completely unreliable or these are made up stories from second century people. Well, uh, I mean, I'm, it's, it's, yeah, it's a double standard. He, he the, We can't trust these early witnesses, even though they all agree on this one point, but he can make up some unattested editor from the second century who had the it, iron an iron fist on the church and just could spread this out like this. It's a double standard through and through. So I don't know, anything else you want to add or I'm going to go on. No, we can get, we can keep going. Would not Kids have accepted crazy. anonymous gospels. Then how did Marcionite Christianity happen? Exactly. In 140s, Marcion of Sinope published a gospel text, which as far as we know, he never attributed to any author. He simply referred to it as Evangelion, good news. It was an anonymous gospel. What followed is exactly what Michael says would have never happened. Marcionite Christianity came to be one of the most popular early Christian movements. Marcionite Christians became so numerous that, for example, Cyril of Jerusalem advised his fellow believers who arrived to a new town to ask specifically for the Catholic Church, because if they just said Christian, they might have been led to the Marcionites. Do you think that Christianity suddenly exploded in popularity soon after Jesus' crucifixion? This is how explosive growth looks like. Le okay, so here we have a little bit of a problem. We can't trust the church fathers when they say 
the authors are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but we can trust them about what was going on with the spread of Marcionite Christianity. So he'll select the church fathers to agree with him when it fits his agenda or not. Uh, I would point out that the data there actually would contradict this idea. I mean, scholars would estimate that by the time of Constantine, less than 5% of the Roman Empire was Christian, if it was even 5%. Uh, more, cons more likely estimates put about like 3 or 4% from what I've seen. The idea there were entire towns that were Marcionite Christian, very unlikely. This seems to just be church father exaggeration about the spread of heresy, which we know they did. Again, I don't just take the church fathers at their word all the time. I look for evidence to uh, like multiple attestation, for example, on points of agreement to say, okay, here's a point we can actually say they were right on. When it comes to when Mark was written, there's disagreement. So I'm not going to look at external attestation as reliable on when Mark was specifically written for that case. So it's just kind of a weird little thing. Camille's being a little selective with the early Christian witness. He can trust him on how explosive Marcionite Christianity was, but he can't trust him on traditional authorship here. Yeah. The other thing it would add is, again, Marcionite Christians were very, very different than traditional Christians. Traditional Christians, as we see in church fathers like Irenaeus, uh, Tertullian, put a strong emphasis on let's what are the traditions that have been handed down to us? We're going to include the Old Testament because that's a tradition that's come down to us. Marcionites rejected that. They were much more about what can we, we need to find certain things to fit with what we want to believe. So they were rejecting traditions left and right if it did not fit with their already theological conclusions. Sam, what were you going to say? Yeah, all I was going to bring up is I don't remember off the top of my head which um, Gnostic groups affirmed traditional authorship and which ones did it. But if we're going to talk about Gnostic groups, we we can we should talk about the fact that a lot of these Gnostic groups did not dispute traditional authorship, but rather just disputed the interpretations of what these traditional authors said. Um, Irenaeus in Against Heresies says Ptolemy, a heretic who lived around early to mid second century, refers to the fourth gospel as written by John, the disciple of the Lord, for instance. So, it, again, it's just kind of like we're being a little selective, it seems like. Uh, as to what's reliable, what's not, and then what we can take at face value and what's helping traditional authorship and what's not. Um, I think we should take the data as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and again, I think the Marcionites are going to be a far different sect because, again, the you're talking about very vastly different groups and how they operate and how they worked. It'd be like comparing Christians today to Gnostics today. I mean, if you go, if you talk to a Gnostic today, they're going to tell you some pretty wild things. Like, uh, I talked to Gnostics that have told me Jesus traveled to Britain to yeah. study Druidism or that he went to Egypt to study esoteric teachings. I've responded to a guy named Billy Carson who keeps citing the gospel of the Holy 12, that Jesus actually learned comedic mysteries in Egypt and the gospel of the Holy 12 is reliable, even though the gospel of the Holy 12 is probably only a hundred years old or so. Like everyone knows it's a modern forgery. Gnostics today are a lot more similar, are going to be much more similar to Gnostics that were the early church was dealing with. These were not people that were going to be necessarily interested in reliable traditions. And we have no evidence they were as interested as, in it as someone like Irenaeus was, or someone like who Papias was, who says he was getting information from living eyewitnesses. So again, there's going to be a huge, dif huge difference, differentiate, we need to differentiate them there too. These are not the same groups. You're comparing apples and oranges. Um, is there anything you wanted to specifically address towards the end, Thanny? Because I'm I think for the most part we've hit most of his main points here. I'm good. And I do want to do the last section though, if yeah. you know what I mean. Whatever no, whatever you want. <laughs> um, so yeah, let's go again. We don't have time to address everything. A lot of rabbit trails go off in there, but I do want to talk about his last point before we close this out. Um, so let me go here to 128.45 here. Because this is sort of him wrapping up, and he sort of gish gallops through a couple different things here about why we should doubt traditional authorship. All the various other pieces of evidence. For example, how the traditional gospel writers, as they are depicted in the gospels themselves, are unlikely to be literary authors, how they make mistakes about events that they supposedly witnessed, like Matthew and John misunderstood poetic parallelisms in the Hebrew Bible, and... This is what I mean. This is what I said earlier. Yeah. If you're going to tell me that Matthew wrote that Jesus uh, rode two donkeys into Jerusalem, I don't think you're being fair to the text. I don't think you have a bias against what the text says. You're yeah. looking for problems and errors. Stephen Carlson recently wrote two papers on this. 
there are uh, the Jenny and the cult in Matthew's messianic entry. And he basically points out this view that Matthew actually claims that Jesus rode two donkeys has fallen out of favor. Most recent scholarship has actually said Matthew's not saying that. He's saying that Jesus sat on the cloaks that they spread across the foal and the donkey. Like, and you see that in all sorts of scholarship. I did a whole video on this. Bernard Batto pointed out, Matthew is not misunderstanding Hebrew parallelism. Yeah. What, what the argument is, is that, is that if you read the prophecy in Zechariah 9, and it says, uh, he shall uh, come in riding a donkey full of a cult. So the claim is that, well, Matthew didn't understand Hebrew parallelism and he thought there were two donkeys there instead of just one. So he has math. So he has Jesus ride two donkeys in. The problem with that view is one is what Bernard Batto brings up. For one, even Dale Allison and uh, Davies are, point out that Matthew in this section is actually quoting directly from the Hebrew. And if he's quoting from the Hebrew, he would have been aware that Zechariah 9 9 uses a masculine word for donkey, not a female word. But what does Matthew have? He says they brought him the donkey uh, and the foal. So he brought a mother and a child, basically, mother and his offspring. If Matthew misunderstood Hebrew parallelism, he should have invented two male donkeys for Jesus to ride in on. He doesn't. He says, he says Jesus rode on the foal and the mother was brought along with them. So scholars like Bernard Batto have pointed out that, no, Matthew understood Hebrew parallelism, demonstrated it quite well. It's far more likely that the mother was just sort of brought along to demonstrate the youth of the animal than anything yeah. else. So, I mean, but this is what I would say, just an example of just, I don't know, just if you think yeah. that Matthew actually made this error, you're not being fair with the text and you're not up to date with the most recent scholarship on this, like with Bernard yeah. Batto's entry in, um, I don't know, he wrote it in a, a, a book, but I cited it in my video specifically on this recently. Yeah. Um, I mean, you hit everything on the head on that one. <clears throat> All I was just going to do is make a joke and say, Jesus clearly didn't ride two donkeys like that. He had one foot on each <laughs> of one of them, <laughs> yeah. each of them. But yeah, no, I completely agree. I mean, like, if you're just going to throw in little things like this, that like, clearly, I, I just, I think a common sense reading of the text is not going to read like this. I think you're going in this with a bias at that point and, yeah. and, and an agenda. Um, yeah, and... The, the one thing, yeah, and so if he wants to say that we're biased towards traditional authorship, I'd say he's biased against it uh, and or biased against reading them. I mean, I don't think he directly said that, although there were hints along the way for sure. But if he wants to make that argument, I'll just say, well, you're biased against it for whatever yeah. reason. But And other things he brought up, he brings up, for example, that things I, I forgot the time markers are, but at one point he mentions, you know, Pappy's is unreliable because he mentions this weird tradition about Judas getting really fat and blowing up kind of thing. Uh, yeah. Stephen Carlson actually wrote a book on this, on his book, his book, Papias of Heropolis. Uh, he makes the case that no, pa Papias did not actually say that. Uh, what happened was is a later author, the book is Papias of Heropolis, Exposition of Dominical Orders, Dominical Oracles by Stephen Carlson. He makes the case that a later author quotes Papias mm -hmm. and then quotes a later tradition. And then later scholars thought the entire quote was Papias, but Carlson shows there's actually a distinction in the original quote. He wasn't actually saying that about Judas. It's a much later tradition. Um, he mentions that maybe Luke should date to the second century because of the work of people like Richard Perbo or um, um, Stephen Mason. That's a very minority <laughs> position. Let's be honest about that. If he wants to say that, you know, we're going to take minority positions. Uh, well, I mean, trying to date Luke that late is very minority. And it's been thoroughly addressed by scholars like Jonathan Bernier or Carl Armstrong in their recent books on Acts. So, I mean, like, again, a lot of issues there. Uh, anything else that we didn't get to you want to address in this, Than? No, not that I can think of. I mean, yeah. we, we've done almost three hours of this. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting exhausted, so we're going to wrap. I'll do Super Chats here in a minute. But final thoughts, again, as I, we've sort of demonstrated here, most of his arguments, especially in the beginning, were just missing the mark. They're not even threats to traditional authorship. A lot of his other arguments are turning molehills into mountains. Um, a lot of his other arguments are just him shooting himself in the foot. None of this threatens traditional authorship because at the end of the day, when you boil all this down, what do we still have? Unanimous attestation saying it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What's more likely? That we have unanimous attestation because it goes back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Or because their original authors were known, but then they were somehow lost in the end of the 
first century. Then some guy in Rome, <laughs> for, made up <laughs> authors with his iron fist on the church. He spread it around. No one stopped him. And then it just took like wildfire. I, I mean, it's just a very convoluted yeah. argument to get away from traditional authorship. At the end of the day, this is far more parsimonious. And this relates to one thing you mentioned earlier about epistemic concerns. Yeah, there are epistemic or philosophical issues when it comes to New Testament scholarship. They'll make these type of convoluted arguments, even though a more parsimonious explanation is going to be the traditional one. Yeah, I, I want to address one thing on that, actually, too, because I, I can hear the atheist may, saying this right now. And it, they're pretty much just going to say, like, well, what's the simpler explanation um, that some Roman guy made all this up? Or is it going to be that traditional authorship is true, the Gospels are reliable, and therefore Christianity is true, that there's a God that is Trinitarian and incarnated and all this other stuff? <laughs> and, right. And, and I think that while, while I can appreciate that, I think there's just an epistemic, a philosophical issue with that thought process. Like, I'm just anticipating that kind of an objection right now. Mm -hmm. and, and the problem is you're, you're, the hypothesis here is not Christian yet. Christianity is true. An entailment or... I don't want to say an entailment, but what the, the issue is that our hypothesis about traditional authorship and the reliability of the Gospels makes it much more likely that Christianity is true. So you have to look at this from the bottom up, not the top down. In other words, you can't look at the consequence of a hypothesis and say, well, the consequence is convoluted and, and not simple, which I would contest. And therefore, your hypothesis is not true. It's the complete opposite. It's the fact that you have to come up with convoluted hypotheses to get rid of the consequence of the simple hypothesis. That's the issue. Yeah, and again, if the Gospels originally were were anonymous in the second century, we'll just go with that. They would the, the chatter about them would have resembled Hebrews because the church was honest. They admitted they didn't know who wrote Hebrews and they had to make guesses. They're not doing that of the Gospels. And again, if there was this guy in this in the Rome in the second century who was who fixed the traditional, who tradic fixed the authorship that we have. Why do you do that with Hebrews? Yeah. Again, the, the Hebrews is a thorn in the side of people who deny traditional authorship. And there's, there's no way around it. If they were anonymous at one point and they made up authors, they would have done the same for Hebrews. And there would have been a wide variety of attestation. Hebrews speaks against this. And it supports the idea of the Gospels were the gospel authors were always known going back to when they were originally written and that tradition spread out. And that's why we find it in Egypt, in Rome, in North Africa, in France, in um, Asia minor. It's just, I don't know. I don't know what to do, man. This just, at the end of the day, I, I, I don't know about you, fam, but I just like, I cannot understand, fathom the argument to say that the tra that traditional authorship came in the second century and is not original. I just, yeah. the evidence is it. overwhelmingly in favor of traditional authorship. I agree. Yeah, and much more convoluted. All right. Thank you for coming to channel Ma member April. Much appreciated. You will gain early access to the next video coming out. Uh, if you had to pick one gospel that's not by its traditional author, which would it be and why is it Matthew? Go, <laughs> what do you? Um, um, I would I, I would say ahead. that Matthew is going to be the, would be the hardest to argue for. I don't think it's impossible. And I still think it can be made quite, quite well and easily. But I mean, if I had, if I had to rank them, the easiest one to argue for is gonna be Luke, then Mark, then John, then Matthew. I, I can I I think I can argue for all four of them. Yeah. But I would say the easiest is gonna be Luke, and the, the sure the hardest is Matthew, I guess. But yeah. I mean, it's like it's not like it's an over. I would say it's like if I'm running in a marath marathon, jumping over Luke is gonna be like a slight mound, and then Matthew's gonna be like maybe like a two foot mound or something. I can still get over it, but it's not gonna be too yeah. hard. Thank you for the uh, gifted memberships. Much appreciated. Thank you for becoming a member. Thank you for becoming a member. Oh, thank you for the gifted wow. memberships. Thank you for that. Um, I want to thank you for your videos. They they refocus me in the uh, Christ path. That's great and much appreciated. Uh, thoughts on myth vision. He seems to have a vendetta and also claims Christian scholars aren't taken seriously. Are his scholars more reputable? Um, well, when he cites people like Dennis McDonald, uh, Richard Miller, these are actually very fringe guys. I mean, even Bart Ehrman is not going to agree with a lot of the stuff that McDonald is going to say. Uh, his idea that they're sort of like the Gospels are sort of copies of Homer's Iliad, uh, Iliad and Odyssey are just very fringe view. Uh, Than, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, um, on MythVision himself, like Derek, I think Derek's a cool guy. Uh, I've talked to him a few times, and 
I like him. Um, I, I'm not really too much of a fan of a lot of the scholars he's brought on um, and a lot of the theories that they put out. I just think a lot of them are extremely unlikely and they don't explain the data very well. Um, I think a yeah. lot of the anti-Christian rhetoric that happens there or anti-Christian scholar rhetoric that happens there is just that. I think it's just rhetoric. Yeah, and I would say that if he has a vendetta, I mean, I do think he has said some things that have been kind of alarming with over the past year. Uh, these, uh, and he made a big video about pr going to war against apologists. That, and I, uh, quite honestly, uh, if Derek wants to have the conversation, I'm still willing to have it on if Christianity is harmful or not, or if it's benefit. Because yeah. a lot of his motives in that video seem to stem from the idea, I think, that Christianity is harmful. We need to fight it because it's causing all these problems. And boy, do I got some studies I'd like to talk with him about. Yeah. Because, I mean, <laughs> I've got a lot of data on this. So if he wants to have that conversation. I am always willing to have that conversation. I don't think that IP responded to the last was Jesus buried in a tomb video, for example. So no, I didn't get a chance to, because I was really busy when Paul came out with that, but I've been wanting to do more live streams. So maybe I could do that sometime in February or March. I'll add it to my list and see if I can. Did Paul Ogia do a uh, empty tomb video? Yeah. He, oh, he responded to me on was Jesus buried in a tomb. And I got so much more I can say on that. Uh, Gosh, so maybe yeah. I should respond to that. I'll, I'll see if I get more requests, if people request it. I will. So we'll see what happens. Just wanted to say that it'd be awesome to see IP and God logic together on TikTok. Sure, but you know, he's got to schedule something. I get busy, and, yeah. you know, got to schedule this stuff. Curious, how would you address the facts that Matthew and Luke directly copy Mark for a lot of their work and the fact that Justin Martyr is writing 50 to 70 years after the gospels were written? Uh, well, I mean, Charles Corals in his commentary on Matthew addresses this quite well. If it was well known that Peter was writing down the stuff or that Mark was writing down the preaching of Peter, Matthew would want to use that for one to be in line with what the church was teaching, you know, like let's, let's make sure we're on the same page, but also because he would have had been closer to Jesus than Matthew would have had because he was in the inner circle of the disciples. Like if I was going to write a biography of my father and I found out my mother wrote one, I'm going to read hers first and probably use some of that because she knows more about my father than I do. That just makes sense from any sort of a, a writer standpoint. Uh, so I don't see this as an issue at all. In fact, I would I think it would be a good thing that Matthew used Mark if it goes back to Peter because it shows he's trying to stick to what uh, the sources say. He's not trying to just invent things off the cuff. He actually wants to see. He's doing research on this kind of stuff and seeing what Peter has said, and so he wants to follow that. Yeah, um, I've I've done a few videos on this, Eric. On testifies done it too done it too um a lot of skeptics like to try to point to like that synoptic problem as some sort of evidential issue against the reliability of the gospels and I, i'm just i'm really not sure because at the end of the day it just comes down to a question of why would they copy each other or use each other and it's just like you're asking a question not really like posing an argument against the reliability yeah i mean i remember talking with mike lacone and he said you know his idea was that maybe uh, I mean, of course, we're speculating here, but maybe Matthew is the one who actually wrote the Q document, and then he got a hold of Mark's gospel, and he's like, you know, I like this idea. Let me take what I've already written in Hebrew, and then make a Greek version, combining what's already here, and then make his own version of it. So I don't see that as much of a problem. Speaking of authorship, a particularly insufferable atheist named Shane Killian called at least part of the New Testament unreliable. His video titled Filtered is called The Dumb Refutes Itself. I'll, I'll take a look. I'll see if I can get to that. Thank you for the uh, super sticker. Much appreciated. If you grant the anonymity theory, what happens to Christianity? What are your thoughts, Than? Not, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think a big problem because a lot of the arguments I'd use for the reliability of the Gospels is internal evidence. I yeah. mean, this was just one video I did, a part of a full series where. So yeah. I, it's not a huge deal, but I think it, it, it does raise the probability of Christianity being more likely yeah. Uh, true. Uh, yeah. I was being a little hyperbolic there. Like, sure, it might hurt the case a little bit, but at the end of the day, I think what's way more important is are the Gospels, like, sourced by people close in time to the life and ministry of Jesus? Are they trying to report, like, a historical reportage? Yes or no? If yes, cool. Jesus should have wrote a Gospel himself. Unchange. Okay. Oh, I mean... He didn't need to. Uh, you know, 
here's the thing. Here's what I say to people like this. So if Jesus is God, he, he can see the future out. He knows what to do to eventually get his goals completed. He obviously didn't need to write a gospel to get there if he is God and he can. He is sort of setting things in motion. As myself, who's a post-millennialist, um, I see there could be some psychological issues in that sort of thing that you know, could be relevant for the Great Commission. But that's a topic for a whole other time. I thought the Holy Spirit was guiding it. Well, yeah, but we can't make that claim when we're arguing externally outside of the Christian community. We need to argue from evidence, which is a Christian, very much a Christian tradition. I think that super chat came in when we were talking about the early church, not the New Testament authors as well. Mm -hmm. So. If we interpret them correctly, the point of later Christians editing multiple Johns and Marks is to show that there is not a clear preserved apost apostolic tradition, but pieces of info that they speculate on to fill out. Uh, first of all, if we grant that, then we still have these different pieces of tradition showing up across the Roman world, all in agreement still. So we have multiple attestation to these traditions being reliable. And again, what, what is the argument going on? Was the gospel of John written by John, a disciple of Jesus? Well, internally, John says it was someone who was witness to Jesus and it ident externally identifies it as someone as John. I, I don't see that as much of a problem if we're not sure if it's John the son of Zebedee or John the elder. It's still John the disciple of Jesus. So I'm kind of confused on what you're asking here, Grace. Uh, Sam, what are your thoughts? Do you, you get what he's saying? Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's just about Camille's argument about the differences and like which John it was or which Mark it was. Because um, at the, in the end of the day, right, like we were saying, we're we're fine even if we do grant that there's not a clear tradition about which john or which mark it is the clearness is the clearness is that it was somebody close and close to the time and place of jesus right. um and so that's the clearness at the end of the day it's like we know it was a mark that was close to jesus it was an interpreter of peter we know it was a john who was close to jesus who was a disciple yeah and again most of the evidence you or I would use for the reliability of the Gospels is going to be internal evidence, not this external attestation. Yeah. The only thing I really use ex for the external attestation is the four traditional authorship, because, again, it's unanimous when it comes to that. Maybe Ehrman was part of the Johan community. <laughs> well, I'm not sure what that was specifically uh, addressed, but. Yeah. Um, why am I cooler <laughs> than you, Shannon Q says? Well, Shannon, you're definitely cooler than Than, but. That's not saying. Yeah, much. all right, you're all right. You're cooler <laughs> than me. I'll give you that because you have the much wittier comebacks, and I I kept trying not to laugh with some of the funny things you were saying in there, and I'm trying to not put it on the screen because I don't want to distract the guests. But yeah, you're cooler than us because you're a you're a woman, and women are obviously cooler than men. <laughs> Actually, no. I will say no. Wait, no. I was going to make the joke, and I'm. A, I would say that. You may be cooler, but we're, but if you're cooler, scientifically, we're hotter. So think of it like that. Yeah. So you can be cooler all you want, Shannon. Science. That means we're hotter. <laughs> all right. Hey, real quick, man. I have to get going because my wife needs to leave and the kids are. Yeah, go for it. I got a couple more super chats, but yeah, thanks for coming on. Thanks for and having me on. Time. Catch you later. Catch you later. Talk to you. All right. Are you keeping an eye out for capturing Christianity's video series about the reliability of the New Testament? Speaking uh, of other YouTube channels, do you remember Cartesian Theist? Do you know what happened to him? Um, so, well, a lot there. <laughs> okay. Um, let me, yeah, I, I am following the series. I think it's pretty good so far. I'm also working on my own series, which will probably be a little bit more in depth because it'll be 11 parts uh, overall. But yeah, I think it's going good so far. I like the guys he's interviewing i had already gotten some of the books of the authors he's mentioning and i got more as well so yeah i think it's great i definitely think it's going well so far but look forward to more conversation around that in terms of your second question that is a whole can of worms sir <laughs> uh so he had a dispute with another atheist youtuber and the atheist youtuber released some information about him that was kind of damning showed him doing some things he shouldn't have done so and the, you know, no one's perfect. I think the honorable thing is that C uh, Cartesian Theist took down his channel and said, you know what, I'm out because what? not perfect. I made some mistakes, just I'm out. So that's kind of what happened. That's that's 
that's the surface understanding of a very complicated, long episode going on. And it's, it's not for me to go too deep into that because it's, I don't want to misrepresent what one side is or spread gossip. So it's just, look, he did some things he wasn't proud of, took down his channel, said, look, I'm just going to, I'm not, I'm not in this anymore. It's, I'm obviously not helping the cause. And I think that's, it's, it's an honorable thing to do. You know, if a pastor messes up, he steps down from ministry. That's just pretty standard. Matthew comments so often four times in chapter two alone fulfilled, or just like Jesus said, strange, nothing about temple destruction. If post 70 AD from Matthew. Yeah. And the scholarship is actually moving in that direction from what I've seen. The idea that, uh, the fact that the synoptics talk about the destruction of the temple or Jesus predicting it is not evidence to post date the destruction of the temple. Uh, a lot of scholarship has moved in that direction as of late in the past few decades. Uh, Check out Michael Patrick Barber's work on it in his book, The Historical Jesus in the Temple, where he talks about the scholarship surrounding this, that it's very likely Jesus did make that prediction. Uh, it's not something that was um, sort of added later, and it's not good data point for dating the four Gospels. And when I upload a video in March, I'll be talking about the dating of the Gospels. So, yeah, I'm going to defend the view that I think the synoptics at least can be dated to before 70 AD. I'm not pushing them back to like the forties or thirties like some do, but for example, Maurice Casey and I think James Crossley date Mark to like the forties. Uh, I don't, I don't even know if I entirely agree. I think that's too early, but I think you can push them into the sixties possibly. John, I think was after 70. Uh, but yeah, there, there's a lot to be said around that and I'll get to that in a later video. So, all right. Uh, with that, uh, what is this? Literally any Christian live chat, regardless of the topic of the conversation, always devolves into transphobia. It's so tough. Yeah, I don't want to do that here. I'm sorry that that happens. I don't encourage that. Um, I think we need to focus on the facts. Uh, but I don't, I don't, uh, although I don't agree with the, uh, the ideology, I don't agree that we should hate other people because they have different ideologies than us. And we should uh, try to extend the love of Christ as much as we can. I try my best. I know I fail at that, and I know others do as well. So I apologize if we have hurt anyone when we are not supposed to. Uh, so appreciate everyone coming. Thanks for the uh, all attending. Those who've stayed the whole time, much appreciated. I will have some more streams coming up, and again, I'll be debating on modern day debate on February second. I'll be debating uh, a Muslim on if Jesus actually died by crucifixion. So stay tuned. More stuff coming on the channel. I will see you guys next time.